Pepsi is um, this high. And, so um, actually, hopefully, will you un no, no. am I unmuted for our local boards too so they can hear some of the CD stuff? Okay. <laughs> hopefully, everyone can hear me. I know I have a loud voice. <laughs> um, welcome to GAR. Yeah. Welcome to video conferencing and the professional standards training. A few continuing education notes and so forth. Um, and I'm Amy Asher with Professional Development. A um, couple things. Where, whatever location you're at, be sure you signed in for CE credit. Without your signature and without your license number, there's no CE, and you might as well take advantage of that. You do need to stay the entire time to earn the CE. Restrooms at GAR, if you go out this air wall opening, then the doors won't make noises and you can go right out that hall to the restrooms. The water dispenser, if you push the button in and then at the same time lower the hot water level, le lever, you can get hot water for tea and you can let go of the button at that point and your hot water will come out. Um, the last page of your handout, this is for all the locations, We'll need you to fill out, it's your evaluation form that is read by like a Scantron, a digital reader. We ask that you bubble in. Um, a lot of us here took the Iowa test when we were little. I know that doesn't even exist by name anymore, but you know how to bubble in. Uh, phones, please turn your phones off. At a minimum, turn them on, vibrate. We have a tradition, at least the GAR, if it goes off during class and we know it's your phone, we ask that you give a voluntary donation to our path. Since it's an education class, if you're uncomfortable with that, we also have our scholarship foundation, but we would love you to make a donation for apologies. Um, if you're using a laptop, please be considerate of those around you. Some people, it's very distracting, the flashing of the screen, or if your keys click, try to put those on silent. Your phone. You'll be away from your phone for about 90 minutes. It's only an hour and a half. Hopefully none of us are doing brain surgery. We can stay in the class and learn all we need to. At break, you'll have a 15 minute break. Return your calls and come on back in, finish your class, and you can go home for lunch. Um, real quick, Christina Chow is GAR's Director of Legal Affairs. She is our inside or internal counsel. She has a law degree from Georgia. Go dog, which is really funny because I didn't even go to Georgia. But um, <laughs> she's very knowledgeable. She's been with GAR four years already. She knows everything and anything that you need to know about professional standards or forms or a lot of other stuff too. So use her as a resource. Enjoy the class. I'm going to get out of the way. Those of you video conferencing, if you'll chat when you have a question, then I will let Christina or, know. Or, or you can raise your hand. I'm actually trying to keep an eye on all our locations so that we can also have you participate and get your questions answered. Thank you. Come out of the way. <laughs> Is this, oh, it's kind of loud. Um, can everyone hear us pretty well, Chrissy, at the video locations? Yes, everyone's nodding, awesome. So to what Amy said, we'll actually have a few cell phone polling things, so that's your time to pretend you're paying attention. Um, and so as Amy said, I'm Christina Chow. I'm the Director of Legal Affairs um, for Georgia um, Realtors. I am their Professional Standards Administrator. Um, as I think everyone here is now that we've gotten the Atlantic Commercial Board on board with statewide professional standards, um, we do uh, we administer the code of ethics and arbitration processes for all but two local boards in the state. So that's how you guys are all here. Um, not relevant to this, I'm also the staff liaison for the Forms Committee, the Legal Action Committee, and our Insurance Trustees Committee. Um, so this is yeah the 2019 Special Standards Training. Break this already? Okay, so the purpose of this training, um, and I think that most of you guys have already taken this, and so um, this is offered every year for our new participants. Um, we make this a requirement every three years. So a lot of you, oh, we have some 
statewide uh, professional standards past chairs and current chairs, and we re have required that in order to participate, you do take this training every three years. So you're appointed by your local board or association for three-year terms. And so once per three-year term, you do have to retake it. Um, so I will say, though, for some of you guys, I know you are all busy agents and um, members. If you are able to take this every year, this is a really, really great training because there is not, I did some code of ethics, but as far as getting involved in understanding this process, you there's just so much that we aren't going to be able to cover every single detail in a three-hour training. Um, so what this purpose is, so unlike a code of ethics class where you're going to be learning about the various articles, what actions may or may not be in compliance with the various articles, this training, you guys are going to be serving on our grievance panels, you guys are going to be serving on our professional standards hearing panels, and this training is really to go through and understand what your role as, as the arbiter, or as the person sitting on the panel hearing the ethics complaint, hearing the responses, and what your role and how to conduct these hearings um, will go. So how did you get here? So the enforcement of the Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual is technically the responsibility of the local board. It's their responsibility and privilege, as NAR says. I don't know if the local board AEs would necessarily agree with that as a privilege, but um, it is their local, local board privilege to do that. However, and I believe it was 2010, 2011, 2012-ish, um, we decided to offer the Statewide Professional Standards Program in which we, as a state association, offered Oh. Offer to um, handle the code of ethics enforcement process on behalf of local boards, local board AEs. I'm sure, as you guys all know, with your local boards, they have so much going on. And so, by bringing it to the state level, we have been able to streamline it, have one person handle it from start to finish, and just know that it's going to be handled correctly. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, the local board association association executive benefit. Um, in return for handling the cases, and this is how you guys all got here, we, as much as I would love to, you know, if anyone who calls wants to participate, I would love to have as many participants in this process because you just can never have enough. However, because this is a local board privilege and responsibility, all appointees have to come from the local board. So typically speaking, what I would I do is, if you're at the end of your three-year term, I typically email you, say, hey, it's been a privilege that you've been serving with us. I hope that you'll consider continuing to serve with us. Um, please reach out to your local board. Some local boards, the AEs have, per their policies or bylaws, have the right to appoint people themselves. Some do it in conjunction with the president, and some do it with the board of director vote at the local level. But all appointees do have to come from the local boards. Um, um, so what is to come? Um, just kind of a big, uh, we'll get into some of the details. For those of you guys who may not already know, um, in September of 2017, or 2018, excuse me, um, at annual conference, the Board of Directors voted to make two big policy changes to the professional standards um, enforcement process. So the first one is gonna be that mediation becomes mandatory. So before you can get in front of an arbitration panel, panel you're gonna have to attempt mediation. At this point, it's currently optional um, for the parties, and then we are also in implementing a citation policy, and we'll kind of get into how that's going to work. Citation is going to be a really big part of the grievance panel now. They already have a really, the grievance panel has a really big task of reviewing everything that comes in, so they are going to be getting another um, step to their process with the citation policy. Um, so as the administrator, um, I am usually the one who gets the calls um, that come in, someone calls, they're upset, they don't know if, could have, if there is a potential ethics violation. Sometimes they're just upset and they need to be heard out by someone who's not their agent or the broker that they're upset with. And so that's what comes to me. Um, I'll either direct them to the website to get their paperwork or what I'll do a lot of times is just send out a template email that I have that says, here's how you fill out the forms, here's our code of ethics, here's what to expect through our process. Um, I will arrange for grievance panel meetings um, with technology, as we can see, we have, I think, seven or eight local boards joining us this morning. We'll have more this afternoon. Everything that we do for grievance panel meetings is via Zoom. So it's from the 
convenience of your office, your home. We do ask that it's private, obviously. These are confidential matters that we don't want to put our members' business out there for anyone to hear and overhear. So I'll arrange a grievance panel meetings. Um, I'll send paperwork between the parties. Um, parties will send me complaints. I will then send the complaint to the respondent if it goes to a hearing. The response will be sent to me, which gets sent to the complaint. I do not hold any paperwork from one party. If it comes to me, it's going to the other party. I, that's the policy. Um, and then I will schedule coordinated hearings. In the Atlanta area, it's mostly going to be at the JR office. Sometimes if the boardroom's busy, I will maybe reach out to the local offices around and see if I can schedule um, at their boardroom. But there's a lot of coordinators involved. You know, um, members are busy, brokers are busy. You know, business panelists are not always going to be available. So I usually try to schedule pretty far in advance, and that's part of the administrator um, portion of my job. And then we'll have the hearing. I send out the decision, any other paperwork. That's all part of my job. You guys, as panelists, participants, are not ever going to have to worry about that. So what I said earlier is that you know, this is not really a code of ethics class, but Obviously, this, a lot of this is code of ethics enforcement, so we're just gonna, the only kind of article stuff we're gonna talk about is in this beginning part, and we're just gonna do a quick icebreaker um, just to kind of get into this, um, get into this. So this is an NAR exercise that we've always really enjoyed, so I'm gonna have you guys, and hopefully everyone in video land can see it as well. Um, all, um, all answers can be texted to this number, the 201-439-8760, so if you have anyone else to text, pretend you're answering my polls as well. So, and then I think it should be in your paperwork too, so I'm gonna scroll over to the next one if you guys need to pull up that number. So, and I think that you guys should have to list the questions that are coming as well. So, the first, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start the poll, and then as you guys read it and text in your answer, we're going to see kind of where everyone falls in regards to how well they know the code of ethics. Hopefully everyone's going to get 100%. <laughs> um, so the first one, I'm going to go ahead and start the poll, if I can, um, is that realtors must always compensate and compensate other brokers for their cooperation in transactions. And so it's one for true, two for false. And are you guys in the local board um, able to have, are you guys seeing this as well in the polls? Are they getting me? Um, it's on the screen, so as far as I know, yeah, there's okay. some people that we're still trying to get visual and work around. Okay. Um, we're working on them. Okay. All right, let's see if there's, should we for any other answers to come in? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this. And so it looks like most of you guys did get this correct. Um, let's go ahead to the next page. So this is actually um, not true. It's Article 3. The obligation to cooperate does not include the obligation to share commissions, fees, or otherwise compensate. So that is the importance of making sure you're in the MLS, checking the co commission agreement offered if they're not the same MLS, using a GNR form, co-op commission agreement. So that is, um, we do as agents and brokers agree to cooperate, but we do not necessarily agree to compensate. Um, let's see, so let's see. The next one is. Uh, realtors protect and promote their clients' interests while treating all parties honestly. And I will go ahead and start the poll. I know someone wants to answer too, just to be facetious. <laughs> Michael Blackburn. He's <laughs> <laughs> always just gonna humble me, so I get there first. It is payback. I, I get there first. Okay. All right, so I think that I think that we can all agree that this is true. It's probably true in life, not just in real estate. But I'm. Um, this is, as you guys all know, probably one of the biggest art, main, main articles, Article One. So that is true. Uh, the next one is that realtors agree to arbitrate financial disagreements with other brokers and their customers. The 
Crystal Lumen. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop with bold. I think that this is one of those things that is a little bit of, I think they just kind of got us on reading comprehension. So this is actually false because we have the obligation to arbitrate with brokers and clients, not customers. Um, and I don't know, did, how many of you guys realize that you actually, should the, your client agree to be bound by the arbitration process, actually have an obligation to arbitrate with your client for the code of ethics? Yeah, okay. Now, a lot of clients may, uh, do not agree to that because they do not necessarily want to be part of, they don't want to be bound by a realtor decision with a realtor, but that is actually an, obliga an affirmative obligation that you have under the Code of Ethics, Article 17. Where's my clicker? So the next A realtor cannot provide professional services when he or she has a present or contemplated interest in the property. Oh, hold on. Let me start the polls. Maybe everyone got it right. Are you guys in video land doing all right? I just want to check in and make sure that you guys are good as well. Yeah? Cool. Okay. Um, we're missing some visuals. Maybe they can hear you better than my chat. Columbus, Augusta, and Atlanta, the filter, and Boston, Maryland. Okay. Let's see. I'm also asking them to start their video. A lot of them have not turned on their video. <laughs> Are you guys not getting visuals out there? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this, and you guys were correct. This is Article 5, that they still can provide these services, but everything must be disclosed. And I think that you guys, as realtors, agents, brokers, know that disclosure is the, one of the biggest things that you guys have to do in various parts of your job. So you can, do, you can undertake to participate in a transaction where you do have an interest, but that interest must be disclosed. The next one is that that realtor receives compensation from only one party except when he or she makes full disclosure to all parties and receives informed consent from the client. looks like most of you guys got that as well. That is true. And kind of back to our previous one, this is all about disclosure. So if you aren't making the disclosure and getting informed consent, then this would have been false. But because you did get the disclosure, you did make the disclosure, you did get the informed consent of your client, that you can receive the compensation from more than one party. And are we doing better in video land? Um, one board that really wasn't set up for morning, so I don't know if they're just on and out long barrow. I don't have um, video, <coughs> video if you can ask them, but it might be that they're just have it on for later today. Okay. Okay, let me go ahead and start. 
Correct. So this next question is that a realtor makes sure that contract details, written or oral, are clearly understood, and when he or she determines it to be appropriate, provides copies to the parties. And we're gonna go ahead and start this poll. And then Walton Barrow, let me see. I don't even see them on my list. They're not. I'll, I'll contact them. Okay. I think they're afternoon. They are just the afternoon, so I don't know if they're just on to have the phone. Okay, call. I see, I see. We're well, checking it out. Oh, did I skip a question? <laughs> Oh, well, this is supposed to, yeah, so the question that I thought you guys should be answering, hopefully, is that they make sure that the contract details for written or are understood and when appropriate, provides copies to parties. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead, and it looks like you guys are, um, have gotten that. Um, it is going to be false. So as, and this is actually for those of, um, who have served on panels in the past, I think one of our bigger ones, that you need to provide agreements to the parties upon the signing or initialing of any and all agreements. And so this is one of those big ones that gets cited a lot um, in articles that says, well, you know, I signed the buyer brokerage agreement, but my agent never gave me a copy. Maybe the agent forgot. You know, they continued with their brokerage relationship, but then they didn't know the terms of their brokerage agreement because they couldn't refer to it. And it may have been inadvertent, but this says that you have to provide it upon the signing or initialing. So um, that is not necessarily when you think it's appropriate, not necessarily when you, whether or not you feel that was an, an important document that they need to have, it needs to be sent to them at their signing or initialing once executed. So that's, and that's also Article 9. And like I said, that's one of the big ones that gets cited when it comes um, and complaints that come to me. Yeah, so, sorry, we're going to be answering those. Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm not sure when this is going to. Okay, so the next one is that realtors are knowledgeable and competent in the fields of practice in which they engage, and they obtain assistance from a knowledgeable professional, or they disclose to clients any lack of expertise. Oh, I'm sorry, did I? Why is... Yeah, hold on a second. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Super great with apparently. All right, so we're going to go ahead and stop that, stop the poll. And then this is going to be true. This is Article 11. Um, that was Article 11, being competent in the fields in which you practice. So the next one is that A. A realtor may advertise in any way that helps him or her promote the sale of their property. Okay. <laughs> Someone's giving away the answers back in that corner. Most of you 
you guys are kind of on board with that, that you can you absolutely cannot do that in any way that helps you prevent the sale of the property. That's not only going to get you in trouble potentially with Article 12 of the Code of Ethics, but also a uh, real estate commission license law, depending on what you have done to promote the sale of that piece of property. So, FYI. So yeah, so you must be honest and truthful in the real estate communication to present a true picture in your advertising, marketing, and other representations. The next one is that realtors willingly participate in ethics proceedings. So we're going to go ahead and start this poll. by signing the membership agreement and by agreeing to abide by the Code of Ethics, you have agreed to willingly participate in these um, ethics proceedings under Article 14. And like I said, I don't, like, it may not really be, it might be begrudgingly, but you have agreed to participate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it may be begrudgingly, but. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm trying to embed these so that it would, each one, I would have to do this, but there's no mistake. So the next one is that realtors give equal professional service to all clients and customers. Oh, hold on a second, I accidentally stopped it. Okay. We're back in business. stop this. So this actually goes to Article 10, and this is true. Um, and as an FYI, in the back of, not the last page, which is your evaluation, but in the back of all the packets should be the 2019 Code of Ethics. So if there are any questions, um, you know, what the Code of Ethics says, that's in the, each of your handouts that was included. So, um, and then, Okay. Uh, the next one is that realtors make only truthful, objective comments about other real estate professionals. <laughs> truthful, objective comments about other real estate professionals is what the, is what the NAR question says. Of 
All right, and the next one is that realtors affect all relationships that other realtors have with their customers. And so this is another, and I heard some people talking about it, this is actually going to be false. Article 16 says that Walter shall not engage in any practice to take any action inconsistent with exclusive representation um, with, that Walters have with clients. Customers are actually always entitled to have representation. So even if you have a customer, if they want representation, they are allowed to get into that relationship with them if you do not have a client relationship with them. Because all buyers are entitled to that representation if they want it. I mean, that's how they get you. That's how they get you, I'm telling you. But yes, absolutely. If it had said client, that would have been completely that would have been a completely different question. Alright, so we're down to our last three guys, sorry. Um, so, realtors refrain from exaggerating, from exaggeration, misrepresentation, or concealment of pertinent facts related to the properties or transaction. Oh, I didn't start it, sorry. very much from here, so we're going to go ahead and stop this one. And this is uh, true. So you are, um, under Article 2, this is your obligation to refrain from exaggerating misrepresentation, concealing pertinent facts about the property or the transaction. Um, and down to the last two, so if there's any other last minute texting or emailing that you need to get done, do it quickly. <laughs> any fees or financial benefits they might receive from recommending real estate related products and services. No, I Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> video and I just want to make sure that you guys are still doing all right out there. You guys good? All right, awesome. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop that and you guys um, got this one as well that you have to disclose any benefits or fees that you are receiving from recommending, recommending real estate products and services. Um, just to be clear though, because I think that this is a big conversation that comes up at NAR sometimes, is that the code of ethics says that if you receive a fee for recommend, recommending it, that you disclose it. Just because you do that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to be in violation of RESPA. So just because you comply with the code of ethics does not necessarily mean that you are not violating other things. If Because RESPA says don't do it at all, regardless of whether or not you disclose for certain um, real estate related products and services. So FYI, I've gotten calls about that a few times. The question, the issue is if it's a violation of RESPA to get a kickback or a fee, regardless of whether or not you disclose it in compliance with the Code of Ethics, Article um, 6, I believe it is, still don't do it. All right. Well, at least you won't get an ethics charge. I mean, that's true. <laughs> but I think you might have bigger issues if, <laughs> than the ethics charge. And then the last one of this 
before like you get there. Oh. Is that realtors agree to keep, or realtors keep funds entrusted from clients to customers in a separate escrow account? actually true. Um, so for the, those who answer false, this is um, the bigger potential violation is not going to be your code of ethics concern, but any potential real estate commission investigation that may or may not be done. Um, I will say the code of uh, NAR and the code of ethics, they're, oh, they're, um, they're not big on saying some violations are worse than others, but the couple of them, they do, the, the couple of big ones, they say, you know what, these are really big this is where the public really relies on you. And our potential violations of public trust include kind of the mishandling of client and customer funds, Article 8, and then the other, other one is Article 10, which hits on just potential discrimination. So like I said, they tend to say a violation is a violation. Um, they don't like to say this is a worse one than this one, but they will, Article 8 and Article 10 are two big ones that they consider potential violations of the public trust if an agent is found to be in violation of these articles by a hearing panel. So, all right, so that was just kind of an intro into the code of ethics, hopefully. Most of you guys got most of those questions right, which is why you want to serve on these panels and um, are familiar with the code of ethics. So what typically happens first, um, as we said, is I'm the administrator, so I'm gonna get the phone call, the email that says, here's what happened X, Y, and Z. I wanna file a complaint, I wanna go to arbitration, I want to talk with someone who may be able to help me work through this issue. If it's a venting issue, if it's just like I'm upset, I feel like I've been bamboozled, depending on what it is, that person's gonna just be me, and I'm just gonna yes ma'am them, no ma'am them. I understand that's really frustrating. And a lot of times that's it. And sometimes, it, you guys all know it, you guys are, you guys listen to it as much as I do, I'm sure, you just need to be heard. Um, depending on the ethics complaint, um, I'm gonna, if they wanna speak with someone who can maybe help them resolve the issue, I'm gonna refer them to an ombudsman. An ombudsman is a third-party realtor who is not involved in the transaction. They're not affiliated with the same broker. They are not affiliated in the transaction. They are just someone who knows the code of ethics, understands the real estate world. Because at the end of the day, I sit behind my desk and I can say practically, here's how our forms work, here's what's supposed to be done, but I'm not out there as you guys are. So you guys can listen to them as brokers, as agents, and say, you know, it's really, you know, sometimes it's a bad timing issue. I'm sorry that, you know, another offer came in as you were writing it and you thought you were gonna, you were gonna agree to it and it's just a bad timing, but there's not an ethics issue here. Sometimes it really is and the ombudsman is there to listen to, if, potent, if possible, help resolve the dispute and so that it doesn't, a complaint doesn't need to be filed. Because sometimes maybe the broker didn't send the agreement and maybe the client's really upset about that as maybe they should be. But if the broker is willing to apologize, if the broker is willing to send that, you know, show to show that they are remorseful, does this need to go to an ethics hearing? And the answer is maybe yes, if it's a repeated pattern of behavior, but maybe not. Maybe it was an accident, it was an oversight, and this is something that this third party ombudsman can help resolve without going through this formal several month process. Um, like I said, it's depending on the situation. So situations that I'm not gonna offer an ombudsman for are the situations of well, I found out that my broker spent my $5,000 um, $5, earnest money. They put it in their operating fund. I found out they didn't put it in an escrow account. Those are the sorts of things that it's really just inappropriate for me to say, let's get an ombudsman involved and have the ombudsman say they're upset because now where's their $5,000? Because the issue is, what would happen is the, hopefully the broker would be like, well, let me repay that $5,000 and make the issue go away. But there's a bigger issue than that. This isn't one of those issues that should just go away if you're mishandling client funds. Another one is when someone feels that they've been discriminated against. I don't, it's not, depending on what they tell me for the most part, I don't think it's appropriate to unbud your way out of what someone's 
perceives to be discriminatory behavior towards them. Um, if it's an arbitration request, I'm gonna explain the mediation process. Um, currently, so as we said earlier, April 1st, we're gonna go to mandatory mediation. But what I will do is someone will call and I will say, here are your options, you can file with me. Obviously, and I know that most of the time for those of you guys who are brokers, you're already speaking to the other broker, but sometimes, every now and then, there hasn't been any broker communication. So I will say, hey, reach out to the broker. You guys, broker to broker, might be able to resolve it. If not, why don't we bring in a third party mediator, similar to an ombudsman. Um, the slight difference is that the mediator, you guys will come together and sit down with the mediator, and the mediator is gonna listen and facilitate communication. The mediator is not gonna tell you how to resolve the dispute, because it's what a panel's for. Um, but I would, I'll explain the mediation process. Let them know it's optional at the moment. Um, if the complainant doesn't want to engage in it, then I don't reach out to the respondent, the potential respondent at that point. If the complainant is open to the idea of it, um, then I'll reach out to the respondent and let them know that, you know, there's a potential um, arbitration request coming. Would you like to try mediation first? And maybe we can just kind of avoid sending it down the process. Um, currently, they have the right to say no. Um, So when the complaint or request is filed, uh, it comes to me and I check to ensure that the E1, if it's an ethics complaint, or the A1 form is filled out completely and accurately. So that includes that making sure that the E1 doesn't list any standards of practices because the agent can only, or the member can only be found in violation of an article. Standards of practices, case interpretations, those things can be cited in support of a finding or even in support of not, no finding of a violation, but they cannot be found in violation violation of the standard of practice. So I'll make sure that if something comes to me and says 15-3, I'll reach out to the filing party and say, hey, you know, please update this. You can keep 15-3 in your summary of why you're filing, but please update this to reflect that it's just Article 15. And then I'll also ensure that the realtor, uh, the respondent is a realtor. Um, I know that in all parts of Georgia, but in the Atlanta area, I know that we have a lot of licensees who are not realtors, so we do get those complaints sometimes. And I do have to let the complaint know that unfortunately their only other recourse is to see if there's anything that the commission will do because they're not realtors and thus not subject to the code of ethics. Um, the A1, which is for arbitration, should only list brokers and, or, and the brokerages. Um, it should not list the sales associates. Sometimes it does, and I usually the group can strike them through, but I'll try to get the broker to update that. Um, for the A1 forms, just as an FYI, for those of you guys who are brokers who may uh, ever need to file a complaint, as you guys know, commissions and fees belong to the broker or broker just first, and that's why only they should be listed. Um, it's always better um, to list both the broker and the brokerage on an A1 form, because in theory, if we have faith with Metro Brokers, if you only list faith read, but not Metro Brokers, you can only receive money from faith. Whereas if you put both faith and Metro Brokers, if faith leaves the company, then you can still have the right to um, pursue Metro Brokers and that qualifying broker there. So I always, it's not, it's not a requirement on the A1 form for both the broker and the broker just to be listed, but I do encourage it just as it protects the complaining party. Um, and then when an arbitration request is um, received, the mediation is offered as well. Um, at this point, mediation is still optional. So we'll get into kind of the way the process works currently up until March, anything that's filed on um, March 31st, anything that's filed April 1st and beyond. So scheduling grievance panel meetings, this is all still kind of um, what I will do for you guys. I try to make it as easy for you all as I can. I try to schedule everything, have everything ready, and then all you guys need to do, and I don't mean all you need to do, but you guys just, if you guys can commit to the date and the times, and then show up and you know I've tried, I will try to make everything as streamlined because I know you guys are busy and are volunteering to make this organi organization better and enforcing our code of ethics. Um, we have regular, regularly scheduled meetings every two to four weeks, so I try to rotate panelists who are on it. I have a few chairs who alternate chairing grievance panel meetings because we, they do re review them so frequently and so often. Um, so it's every two to four weeks depending on the time of year. For those of you guys who served on grievance panels, you guys know that you'll probably serve with me anytime, anywhere between maybe two 
three, four times a year. Sometimes it might be more, depending if I can't get anyone else. Sometimes it might be a little bit less frequently, um, depending on you know if I'm getting a lot of complaints from the same broker, from the same brokers or same brokerages. I don't want to put anyone on that panel, obviously, who would have a conflict of interest. Um, they're all teleconference meetings via Zoom, so it will all be similar to how we are conducting this training. We'll send out video conference links. You'll sign in from the privacy of your own home, your office, um, and there's no need to come into the office for the grievance panel. Uh, so materials are usually sent out uh, 72, 48 to 72 hours in advance. I, like I said, want to give you guys the opportunity to review them. I don't personally find it um, helpful for everyone to be kind of sitting in silence reviewing it. Um, that is, I know how it's been, um, so it's been done in the past, it's how some boards did it prior to coming to statewide, but I do like to send it in advance so that when we do meet, you guys are kind of ready to make the best use of your time. Because, like I said, especially at the grievance panel level for you guys, you guys are reviewing every single complaint that comes in, regardless of the fact of whether or not it may move forward to a hearing. You still have to review it and decide whether there needs to, there, it needs to go to a hearing. So you guys are gonna be very busy. Um, during the grievance panel meeting, you're going to be provided with a checklist of things to check off um, to make sure that you are evaluating each complaint kind of in a uniform manner. Um, I will do my best to check off the administrative items. Is the person a realtor? If it's an arbitration, is the party listed? The broker? Is the brokerage firm listed? You know, are the articles listed? Um, but the rest is for you guys to kind of review and determine. Has the complaint been filed in 180 days? Typically speaking, I, a lot of times I can look at it and say there's going to be, there shouldn't be an issue here. Sometimes that there is the issue because, as you guys know, most of the 180-day filing deadlines say 180 days from the time of the action or when you could have been made aware of the action with reasonable diligence. And that's not my decision to say when a reasonable person could have discovered an agent's potentially unethical action. So that is still something that the panel is in charge of reviewing and making that determination. That is not... Well, it seems administrative, that's not an administrative task that I can do. So depending on if it's a grievance um, for an arbitration request or an ethics uh, request, you're going to have a couple of different analysis. So during the grievance panel meeting, um, the 180 days is was the complaint filed within 180 days of closing or when the realtor principal could have known, or this is arbitra oh, sorry, arbitration. Uh, or when the realtor principal could have known about the closing with reasonable due diligence. Um, I believe that that last part was added um, several years ago by NAR because I guess in some states there are ways to hide closings. And then some agents would wait until after 180 days before filing it or whatever it was. They would find a way to hide it and then it wouldn't become public until after, until 181st, 182nd day and then say there's, it's no longer arbitrable by the association. Um, when it was never, the complaining party would have never been able to discover it because it was hidden or it was not disclosed or, um, so that has now been added by NAR that, um, as a factor to the 180 days. Um, so your main question to be asked if you're on the grievance panel is if the facts assumed are to be true, is there an arbitral issue that can be heard by the Georgia Association of Realtors Arbitration Hearing Panel? So I think one of the big issues that we, um, I want to kind of emphasize in this for the grievance panel, um, panelists are, what are the arbitral issues that can be heard? Um, I think that a lot of times, you know, we provide this wonderful service. We hope, hopefully it's a little bit faster and more expedited than going through the legal proceedings. Sometimes it's hopefully a little bit less contentious than having to go to the court and being summoned and you know getting these getting served. So we tend to see there's a monetary dispute and we want to think that in order to help out our fellow realtors, we need to hear the complaint. However, we are actually guided by Article 17 of the Code of Ethics. And the Article 17 says these are very specific arbitral disputes that we can hear. We cannot hear every single thing that comes in, whether or not it's a monetary dispute. So arbitral issues, and so not all monetary disputes are arbitral by GAR, um, and they're outlined by Article 17 of the Code of Ethics, um, and they are limited to the following. 
uh, contractual disputes between realtor, firm, realtor principals of different firms. So if there is a contractual dispute, any contractual dispute between realtor firms, um, different realtor firms can be arbitrated by the association. So a lot of times what this ends up being is a contractual dispute over um, fees that were owed that they agreed upon, Some, someone didn't pay it, we can hear that there's a, if it's in writing and if it's in, um, um, been signed by the brokers. Um, the next are specific non-contractual disputes as outlined by Article 17. Four. So these are going to be a lot of the procuring costs, the non-contractual disputes. You don't typically have a contractual dispute between two buyers, agents, or two buyers, brokers who are saying that they are both the procuring cause. So the non-specific contractual disputes that can be heard by GI <coughs> include where a listing broker has compensated a cooperating broker and another cooperating broker subsequently claims to be the procuring cause of sale or lease. So I think this is the one that we are probably most familiar with, the procuring cause, I'm a listing agent, buddy comes to me and he thinks he's the procuring cause, but then for whatever reason, the buyer has another agent and I pay that agent and now buddy wants to, wants to be compensated as well. Um, so the way this can go down is that the listing agent can bring the arbitration with both parties and if he hasn't paid it out yet and have the panel say, tell me who to pay and then when that decision is made, the two buyer's agents have agreed to be to that, that decision. Um, if it's already been paid out, if I've already paid it out, I don't have the, I don't have the money anymore. The arbitration can technically still be brought against the listing agent, but the listing agent would then bring in the other buyer's agent who was compensated. Or it can just be between the two buyer's agents, the one who was compensated and the one that was not, because the listing agent is no longer, no longer has the funds. So those are, those are the way that the listing agent or that the procuring cause of commission can go down in the first um, instance of a non-contractual dispute. Um, the second is where a buyer, tenant, representative is compensated by the seller or landlord and not by the listing broker and the listing broker as a result reduces the commission owed by the seller or landlord and subsequently such actions and other cooperating broker claims to be procuring cause of sale. Um, And these are all straight from the from standard practice 17.4. And this should all be in your material. Sorry, this is not. Okay, and then the third is where a buyer or tenant representative is compensated by the buyer or tenant, and as a result, the listing broker reduces the commission owed, and subsequently a cooperating broker claims to be procuring cause. Um, the fourth one is actually really important to notice the difference. Where two or more listing brokers claim entitlement to compensation pursuant to an open listing with a seller or landlord who agrees to participate in the arbitration who agrees to be bound by the decision. So what this does not include is two agents who, for whatever reason, have overlapping exclusive listing agreements. So if you have two listing, if a seller has signed two listing agreements, and for whatever reason, there is a dispute over when an offer came in, when, you know, whose term it was under. This is not, that is not an arbitral dispute by GAR. There's not to say that there isn't a dispute, but that is not one that can be arbitrated by the association. If there is, the only listing, the only disputes between listing agents that GAR can hear is when there is an open listing and I don't know in four years that I've been four years I've been here how many people I've heard have had open listing agreements. So. So does that mean that if if two brokers claim it was their listing period, that they have to report? Yes. Yes. Repeat the question to make sure I can hear. Oh yeah. So the question was that if two listing brokers have signed agreements with the same seller if they can if they have to go to small claims court or it depends on the amount I guess regular um, court to settle that and the answer is yes because the issue at that point is not with the other listing agent it's with the seller who signed too and it's not for GAR to decide which listing agent is more entitled because they both have signed agreements by the one party um, and the last one, the last specific non-contractual dispute um, is where a buyer or tenant representative is compensated by the seller or landlord 
and not as not by the listing broker, and the listing broker, as a result, reduces the commission owed by the seller or landlord, and subsequent to such action claims to be the current cause of sale or lease. So this kind of goes in back to what we were saying as some disputes that are not arbitrable by the AR. And like I said, this is really important for the grievance panel to kind of know and recognize and understand these situations, because if a grievance panel tells me that this is arbitrable, I'm the administrator and you guys are the panelists. You guys, this is your process. This is your enforcement process for your members. This is your right, privilege. And I am the administrator and I'm here to kind of make sure that this process runs as smoothly as possible, but to make sure that it's being executed and enforced according to the members, according to the members, I guess, the way that they are instructed to kind of understand and move things forward. So for grievance panel, it's really important to understand, like I said, that not just because a monetary dispute comes in front of you, that it should just not automatically be pushed forward. And when you do go to arbitration, and when I am on grievance panels, what I will try, what I try to do is encourage the grievance panels to tell me which, to point out the contractual dispute, so if it is a contractual dispute, that contract should have been provided, to point out where the issue is, or to specifically tell me which one of those non-specific or non-contractual specific situations this falls under so that you can really understand why this is or is not arbitrable by the association. So disputes that are not arbitrable by GAR include disputes between an agent and his or her broker over commissions owed under an independent contractor agreement. Unfortunately, these are a lot of calls that I get from agents who no longer hang their license with their broker, but may have had some open, you know, had some brokerage agreements in place still with terms that had not ended, that you know had a house under contract, but they didn't see it to closing. This is that that's a, a, a contract that you can have enforced if you believe that your broker is not paying you what is owed under the independent contractor agreement. That needs to be enforced via small claims court via or not by GAR. Um, we are also not going to hear and settle disputes between two agents, two agents of the same brokerage. Um, it is GAR's policy that that is the responsibility of the broker. Um, if there is a dispute over, you know, you have two agents who both claim to have a buyer, that's, the commission belongs to you, Mr. Broker, so you can figure out which agent is or is not more entitled to that fee of what you'll pay out. So we are not going to step in and tell the broker how they need to divvy up their fees to their agents. And then lastly, like I said, the disputes between listing agents pursuant to an exclusive listing agreement. That is gonna be ultimately, and I think sometimes it's easy to get frustrated with the other listing agent who came in after you maybe, or right before you when, and when the issue arose, but that's really gonna be an issue with the seller. Um, and so that is not gonna be something that GAR is going to um, arbitrate. So before we kind of move on, as far as arbitral issues, because at the same time, what I will say is that the grievance panel, for those of you guys who have served, for those of you guys who are going to be new, you guys are going to, it's, it's a lot of work, and sometimes things get missed and overlooked. And so sometimes things get moved forward that shouldn't, whether you know, maybe it was actually outside the 180 days, maybe it wasn't an arbitral dispute. So if something comes to you as a hearing panelist, you also need to be able to read the facts and recognize that maybe this is not arbitrable by the association. This appears to be two listing agreements. This appears to be, you know, an agent. This even though the agent's no longer with the broker, this is a dispute from when the agent was a bro uh, was with that broker. So, if it gets to a hearing panel and it's not arbitrable by the hearing panel, the hearing panel still has the obligation to dismiss that complaint if they if they see that it's not arbitrable if it was moved forward by the grievance panel. And I will say that, you know, that the grievance panel reviews everything that comes before them, not just the ones that are important, not just the ones that seem really, really important. They review every petty complaint that comes in that's been filed, everything that seems that was just a disgruntled person who is looking to just, who's just out for the person for no reason, they get everything. So the hearing panel also needs to understand that what what is and is not arbitrable by GAR. So before we move on, I just kind of want to address if there's any questions about arbitrability. Anything in video, Andy? Okay. This is not really a question about 
uh, whether it's arbitral or, or not, but are you going to be able to provide some sort of guidance to the uh, respective panels in this area? I mean, you're reviewing the paperwork up front and you're determining whether it falls within that 180 day period, or, or at least that's what I gained from the earlier material. So, um, in terms of whether or not uh, it's arbitral, um, are you going to be able to advise us? So, my role is to. So, the question was, I'm sorry, is that what is basically my role in guiding? any panel as far as you know whether or not something is or is not arbitrable, whether something, you know. So my role is, like I said, to make it as easy for you as possible. So I'm going to give you these things. I'm going to give you these, here are the five non-specific, or non-contractual specific disputes. Here are the issues that are arbitrable. I, what, I, what I'm not going to do, what I can't do is tell you that you must dismiss this, you must do this, you must do that. Be, I'm going to say, hey guys, this looks like it might be uh, two listing people fighting over it. I don't see that it's open, but maybe there's a special stipulation that does open it up between these two people. That's not for me to decide at that point, but I am gonna, I will say, hey, this looks like the bro, this, if I understand it correctly, does this agent used to be part of this brokerage? Is that what the dispute is over? Look into that, but if you still, if the panel still tells me no, and I've unfortunately had panels who have told me, no, I think you're misunderstanding it, which, to be quite frank, I'm not out there in the field as you guys are. I can very easily misunderstand the facts that are put on paper um, and not necessarily understand how it's supposed to be playing out. So I will be there to give guidance, but I won't be there to tell you this is what you need to do because that decision is up to you. And like I said, sometimes grievance panels have gotten it wrong and it goes in front of the arbitration panel and they'll review it and say, we don't see the arbitrable issue here. Um, and they, like I said, if we, if we can't hear it, we have to dismiss it if, if it's caught. You know, and maybe it's, and maybe it's unfortunate because parties are there, but something that can't be heard, if the hearing panel tries to hear something that is not arbitrable, there's, it's not enforceable, it's no longer enforceable, and that's an even more, uh, an even larger waste of time, of everyone's time. So, like I said, the grievance panel does a really, really good job of catching what they can, but sometimes with like I said, the number of things that they get, things do slip through the cracks, and so it's important for the professional standards hearing panelists to understand the grievance panel's role to know also here's what you guys need to be looking for. Um, yes. Christina, you could add to that list um, disputes that the amount is too large or too small. Has the CAR established the too large or too small amount, or is that done by the grievance committee and or the hearing panel? So the question for those in video land who may not have been able to hear was that um, part of the check, and it's on the checklist um, as well, is, is the amount, the grievance panel checklist, is the amount too large or too small? I think Bert also added, is, there, is it too legally complicated? Those are factors in considering on, that the grievance panel has to consider when moving it forward. At the moment, GAR does not have a threshold, of a minimum threshold, or a maximum threshold. I will say that I think a maximum is probably unlikely to be imposed, given that, especially we just signed on with the commercial board, um, and I'm sure that their um, transactions, given how long they take, may be a little bit larger than some of the ones that we get um, on the residential side. So there is no maximum. Um, the legally complex, I think we've had one or two at the time I've been here where the grievance panels reviewed it and just said, this is something that needs, especially for the amount, this is something that maybe needs to be fought out between the parties and their attorneys because our, we're confused, the hearing panel is most likely gonna be confused, and we may not be, just given the, the legal facts, may not be able to render a great decision. And so that is one of the factors that if you're flipping through this, it's just complicated from paperwork, special you know, documents, et cetera, that the grievance panel can say, you know what, you've done the right thing by filing with us. This is too legally complex. Go ahead and, you know, you no longer have the obligation to arbitrate with us, take it to the court. Um, and then the too small amount to address that, there is a $250 filing fee by both parties to file with GAR to arbitrate. So the $250, not for ethics complaints, just for arbitrations. So the $250, I would hope, guides 
what is too small of an amount if you're having to pay a filing fee. Um, we have not dismissed uh, something um, from the Grimms Fund for being too small of an amount. Um, currently, we have one that is for um, I guess <coughs> maybe just about at a thousand. And you know, it's also when we I've gone in our trainings, we've spoken about this is that this is a member benefit, and yes, we want to make sure that we're not we're not putting our personal opinions on what is too small of an amount, what's not worth it onto someone else who does feel maybe that this is worth it if they're willing to go through this process. But I think that like the, there's a 250 filing fee, hopefully that guides it a little bit. Um, to address the 250 filing fee, it has to be filed with your arbitration request. Um, and then if the parties mediate it and they are successful, the 250 goes back to the complaining party. If they don't mediate it, I send the complaint to the respondent. When they file their response, they also have to file a 250 filing fee. And then what we do with that, the 250 filing fee for each party is that the prevailing party of the arbitration receives their 250 back, whereas the party that does not prevail, their 250 is put in, um, it's um, given a GAR, I believe, it, I'm not quite sure what fund it gets put into, but it's, it, it's retained by GAR. And this just helps to ensure that the parties are really trying to work together with one another, that they're really you know, kind of all in on this arbitration and not just withholding funds and fees to be a bully or to be, you know, just because they can. <coughs> so, um, yes, it's 250 only for arbitration requests. We do not require any filing fees to file an ethics complaint. Shocking Christian that travel <laughs> I mean, someone's got to do it. Yes. If they can dismiss it because it's too legally complex. And then they end up yes, and the parties, so um, with any, I think it's a later slide, but the party is always given, if it's something is dismissed, the party is always given the opportunity to appeal. So the party can say, well, this grievance panel just, they were too lazy, they didn't review it close enough, they didn't, um, you know, I'm going to appeal it to a new grievance panel, and maybe they will not think it's too legally complex. And they will move it forward, and the that grievance panel may say, "Oh yeah, this is this is pretty clear. We can handle it. We've got some really really smart realtors who can definitely parse through this." Or they can say, "No, definitely not. Let's go ahead and dismiss it again." And the parties at that point are welcome, are no longer bound by their obligation to arbitrate with their arbitrable dispute with GAR, and they can then take it to the courts to an arbitration, um, an independent arbitration company like JMS or Hennings or whatnot. So, um, but yes, they, that is one of the reasons for dismissal is that it's too legally complex, whether or not it's arbitrable. Um, so um, before we get into the new required mediation, are there any other questions as far as arbitration at the grievance panel level? Anything in the video landing, sales and guns? Everybody will stay up here. Okay, <laughs> not for long. <laughs> um, so, Starting, so this is going to be one of our new things. Um, starting April 1st, um, anything that's filed on April 1st, not necessarily anything that's reviewed. Um, so depending on when we have our previous <coughs> panel uh, meeting, something if we have it on April 4th, if it's filed April 1st, it would be subject to this policy. If it was filed with me on March 31st, it was going to be subject to our current policy. So currently, um, medi um, optional mediation is offered upon receipt of the filed arbitration request, and it's still if. I speak with the complainant and I say, hey, we'd like to try mediation. They may say, no, not right now. You know, I've tried working it out. And that's okay. Like, let's just go ahead and file it and get it through grievance. If the grievance panel comes back and says, you know, we're going to move it forward, I'm going to, I typically ask again, like, do you want to try mediation? Like, should I ask them when I send them the complaint if they are going to be willing to try mediation? And the answer, if it's yes, then I include in the letter to the respondent, hey, here's an arbitration request. The complaint is open to mediation if you're if if you're open to it because it is optional. And if they say no, then that that part gets left out because currently both parties must agree to do this. So starting April first, if the grievance panel determines there is an arbitrable dispute, then the parties are required to attend mediation prior to going before special standards arbitration hearing panel. So at this point, um, after anything that's filed with me on or after April first, if it's an arbitration dispute. At some point before you can get in front of our hearing panel, 
you're going to get in front of a mediator. And that is now JR policy um, starting April 1st. If you refuse to do that, because it is part of our policies, um, that could be considered a membership violation. And then you may have to deal with any sort of membership violation, including fines or whatnot from the association for violating that. So the way that this is going to work is currently, um, as I said, we have the complaint who request it. When did they file to pay that $250 arbitration? So the question was, when do they pay the um, arbitration fee? And the, question, um, the response is, they file it when they file their arbitration request. And if they're the respondent, when they send in their arbitration response. So mediation is after they pay the $250. Mediation could be before or after. So if it's before, if it's, so if someone calls, so if, some, if, for, if you call me and say, I have a dispute with Buddy, I, you know, would like to mediate it. <laughs> I, would, I would like to try mediation and see if we can resolve it. I don't want to go through all of this. Because really, even for mediation, you don't have to file any paperwork. It could be just two people coming and sitting down. And so you can reach out and say, I'd like to see if you would get in touch with Buddy. And if we could just sit down with a third, a mediator and see if we can just hash this out. I don't want to necessarily file the paperwork unless I really have to. So no fee is paid. So no fee is paid at that point. However, if I get a request, it is my obligation, if I haven't offered it yet, to offer you mediation. So I can, I will offer it to you, after, if I haven't, especially if I haven't already spoken with you on the phone or via email and offered you mediation, I will offer it to you after I have received your arbitration request. And because once you file a request with me, it has to go to grievance. So at that point, you've already said, I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm going to file this request. I want it to go to grievance. If you want to try mediation first, that's fine, we'll hold it. And then if you're successful in mediation, that 250 is returned back to you. Yes, Melody. Um, do you have the option of, instead of mediation, do an ombudsman so that, I'm assuming with mediation, everybody has to be together. Mm -hmm. And say if one, you know, if, if for whatever reason people choose to do Ombudsman instead of mediation, is that going to be an option? No. So for arbitration, when it's money, because you have to have a written and signed agreement as well. Okay. And so a lot of, and we talked about this when we were um, in our professional standards meeting, subcommittee meeting, is that um, the pushback is that brokers have already tried to work it out with other brokers nine times out of ten. And that, you know, and a lot of times when I ask someone why they don't want to do mediation, it's that we, I've already tried, you know, it's an extra step. I don't, but we've shown, and across this, um, the country, there are a lot of associations. I think NAR is that over 100 associations, um, if, because most of them still handle it locally, not at the state level, have implemented mandatory mediation. And the fact of just getting people together at the table, that a lot of times will at least start the talking. And, you know, that, that it facilitates the conversation. Whereas ombudsman for ethics complaints, you know, you can call the broker and say, hey, this person's really upset. You didn't, you weren't promptly returning their phone calls. You weren't, you know, you were responding by text even though they prefer to talk to you on the phone. And they're just really upset because you're not giving them the representation that they think that they deserve. And that can, that, there doesn't need to be a signed agreement to kind of fix that issue. Whereas if you have a mediated agreement, do you want them to sit down and real, quite frankly, I encourage the mediator to have the parties write their agreement, their terms, so that there's no misunderstanding of what they agree to and sign. So the ability to discuss it over the phone or remotely is not going to be an option for mediation when it's for arbitration disputes. So currently, we have that the, the complaint optionally can request a mediation prior to filing. If the respondent agrees, they mediate their dispute, they move on. If the respondent turns, currently the respondent can turn down mediation, or they can try the mediation, but they're unsuccessful. Both brokers are holding the ground, they both believe they're right. So the complaint will file the arbitration request, which is reviewed at the next meeting, and the grievance panel for the reasons that we discussed. There's no arbitral issue, they're filed up at 180 days, it's too complex. They can dismiss it, or they can forward it for a hearing. And I, this is not this is not in your packet. This is something I went ahead and added in as I was kind of going through. So, um, um, and then currently it's optional. If the parties um, were not off, were offered mediation, if it was not attempted prior to the filing, um, to the arbitration request, um, 
they can try at that point. Because at this point, the respond a lot of times prior to going to the grievance panel, the respondent might think, you know what, there's still not a dispute. I don't believe that there's an arbitrable dispute, so I don't even want to waste my time mediating before that. But once it goes to the grievance panel, the grievance panel is saying there's going to be a hearing. So we're already telling you that there is going to be an arbitrable, there is most likely, like I said, sometimes things slip through the cracks, but most likely there is an arbitrable dispute, there is going to be a hearing. And so at that point, a lot of times the respondent's more open to mediating after that step. Um, currently, the parties can still decline mediation, or they can try it and they can be unsuccessful, and we'll go to a hearing. So any complaint that's um, filed and received by March 31st of 2019, is going to run by this process. Um, policy starting April 1st. So you'll notice the first few slides will look exactly the same. At this point, if Bert calls me and says, I'd like to mediate with Buddy, if it's April 1st, it's still optional at this point. Because what we have to remember is that the grievance panel doesn't hasn't reviewed it and determined definitively that there is an arbitral issue. And we cannot require Buddy to mediate if there is no arbitral issue. So if you call me and request it, the respondent still at this point can say, no, I have no interest in it. And Burke can say, OK, well, I'm going to go ahead and file. And then it was reviewed by the grievance panel. The grievance panel can dismiss it, or they can do it for, for, for a hearing. What is going to change is that the parties must attempt mediation if it was not attempted prior to the filing of the arbitration request. Um, and they can go to mediation and be successful, or they are unsuccessful and they go to a hearing. So the difference is, is that, like I said, it's only after, after the grievance panel has reviewed the arbitration is that at that point is it mandatory on the respondent. So before the grievance panel has reviewed it, the respondent can still choose to arbitrate it, or to mediate it, excuse me. Um, and if they attempt mediation at that point and it's unsuccessful, we're not going to make them attempt it again. But the point is that at some point, the parties need to sit down in front of a mediator. And they need to give it a good faith effort to try and resolve their dispute. And if it doesn't work out, then they will always have the right to go to the panel. Yes? There's a 250 filing fee. Who pays for the mediation and who pays for the arbitration? There's obviously got to be some fees involved. So actually, that is one of the benefits of JR. So the question was, the 250 um, are paid, and how does that pay for the arbitration? and you know, seem to be the required mediator. So the, if, if, it, if it ends up in front of a, an arbitration hearing panel, someone's going to lose their 250. If it is resolved successfully by the mediator, both parties are going to receive their 250 back. This is a completely free, um, we, it's a completely free offering. And I want to say benefit, but now it's a requirement of GAR, because we want our brokers and our agents to mediate. We want them to retain good, good relationships. And while I, in my opinion, um, an arbitration panel is still better than going in front of a judge and a jury, you know, going that method, I would be lying to say if it didn't get contentious at times. You know, when you talk about anyone's money, someone's going to be, someone's going to get upset. So mediation allows the parties to come to their own decision. It allows them to make a decision that, and it may be that sometimes the decision is that, oh, you were correct, you should get all of it, or oh, you were right, I didn't realize this fact, and you should get, you know, I should have, the money should have been paid to you, or maybe there's some sort of split, but the mediation allows the parties to hopefully walk away from the table both happy. And so we want our members to do that and engage in that, so we are requiring it, and we are not charging a fee for it. So there are no. And arbitration? The arbitration is, no one's paying for it in the sense that it, the cost of the panel or the cost of you know anyone involves time, but the, it's just the 250 filing fee, and it's whichever party does not prevail because it requires that it ensures that the parties or the brokers do have some a stake in the game that they are committed to you know what they believe is to be the right decision that they made and that or like the right decision to come and pursue the arbitration in front of the panel. So that is. Yeah, and one last question. Do you do you see a lot of success with the mediation um, involving disputes? Yeah, so when it goes to, so the question was, you know, the success of mediation, and I think that this is what's going to make mandatory mediation. I know that no one, including myself, probably most of you likes to be told you have to do something, 
or you have to engage in a process that you prior would have maybe turned down. But we have found, I think, it's usually, I think it's about a 90% success rate for GAR. We have some very, very good mediators. Um, and we don't have mandatory mediation yet, so I can't speak to the parties that don't want to be there. But from stories that I've heard from other trainers, from other uh, local boards or states who have implemented this, the mere fact of getting the parties there is half the battle. The mere fact of getting them there, and in theory, I guess they can come and they can just refuse to cooperate, you know, refuse, they're not, no one's budging. And th that's their right. They came, they tried, they both went together to see their side and no one's moving, no agreement, go to arbitration. But a lot of times from what I'm told by those who have implemented this policy is that getting them there is half the battle. And then they start to talk and then it's no longer as contentious as getting in front of a panel and you know, saying, I can't believe you acted this way. And all of a sudden things that maybe aren't as important kind of start to interfere with what will later be your relationship after this arbitration proceeding. So I think that it's gonna still be very successful in our mediation, not every, it's not 100% by any means, but I think it's about 90. So, yes. Excuse me, are the mediators um, part of the Realtor Association? Yeah, so our mediators are part of the Realtor. Uh, the question was, um, are the real mediators Realtors? And the answer is yes. Yes, Michael, I think. Um, you've got up there, if it was not attempted or uh, prior. Uh, yeah. If they've attempted mediation, uh, what uh, validation are are we asking for to show they have already attempted mediation? Well, we must attempt mediation through GAR, so I would be, I would know. Okay, so this is just referring to if they've not already attempted GAR yes. mediation. Yes, yes. It's not if they've already tried mediation with an outside group. If they're filing an arbitration right. complaint, right. they're gonna go through the GAR process. The mediation process. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the, oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, um, you know, if the parties attempted mediation prior to filing the arbitration request, how do you, you know, what validation? So if they contact me prior to filing the arbitration request and I set up the mediator knowing that, you know, if it's successful, great, we've done a wonderful member service for our, for our members. Um, and then we move on and hopefully never have to hear about this request again. <laughs> if it's unsuccessful though, knowing that they're gonna, the complaint is then gonna file with me. Yeah. And then, right, and so, and if they attempt it prior to filing, oh gosh, if they, if they attempt mediation prior to filing with us and with JR, with the JR mediator, they're not gonna have to try it again after. We're not gonna make them come two and three times to mediation. But if they attempt to mediate it, or if they attempt to tell me they mediated it outside of our process, that's well and good. This is our process for GAR. Yes, Melody. Um, I know with arbitration they can bring an attorney if they like, mm -hmm. and you know their broker and everything. With mediation, what are the rules as far as witnesses and yeah. that kind of thing? So the question question is with arbitration, you know, you can have witnesses, attorneys, brokers, agents, whoever it is that you need to bring to make your case, defense, etc. And what are the rules for mediation? And that's really the answer is that's going to be guided by the mediator. Um, most will say witnesses are irrelevant because the mediator is not there to decide the case for you. The, so your witnesses, if they're proving your case or not, this is a discussion between the parties that they need to be having your witnesses come to the arbitration if it gets there. But for the purpose of discussion, witnesses really, in most mediations, I will say, are probably not going to be relevant. That's going to be the discretion of the mediator. Um, attorneys should always go on be involved. I don't always think attorneys are great because they sometimes like to dig in their heels, <laughs> myself included sometimes, <laughs> but they, you know, you're always entitled to legal representation. So if you have an attorney, they will be allowed to come. The broker obviously has to be involved. Um, and for, I guess for most mediations, your sales associate who was involved in the transaction, unless it was you took yourself as the broker, but witnesses, really, I think most mediators are going to say are not relevant to a mediation. Okay, so there's not a rule that they can or can't come. Correct. Let, that's most, that's typically the discretion of the mediator. I thought I saw the other hand. <coughs> Video land hand in there. Trying to. Yes. For the court board, who decides uh, who the mediator is going to be? So for the court. 
commercial, so the question is for the commercial board who decides who the media is going to be. Um, typically speaking, the answer is technically me, but as the, because as the administrator, I set up all of the, you know, the processes and, you know, the panels and whatnot. What I would typically do is I would defer, not necessarily defer, but I would work in conjunction with um, Reggie or not Marriott, um, Robin, and just to kind of you know get her input who is not involved, who hasn't, who's not involved, who may be good for this type of commercial. Because my understanding is that all commercial transactions are very, very different, so it might not be the best to have you know a multifamily person with a, if it's a retail issue. So I the answer is officially me, but I am always going to work in conjunction with the commercial board just to make sure that, and it, it may be that as I get to know more people that at that point I, don't, I no longer need to do that, but for now it would be me in conjunction with Reggie or Robin. Okay. I just didn't know if there was a pool of people that you pull from, like for the grievance panel. Right, or and we're still kind of working, yeah, we're still kind of working through this with the commercial board, those details of how we select people and you know, I haven't had too many things from the commercial board yet, knock on wood, but we'll see. Um, do we have any other questions about um, kind of the current process for mediation versus what's going to be coming starting April 1st and on? Awesome. Um, do you guys have any, do you guys like the idea of um, mandatory mediation? No? Yes? Yeah? <laughs> One side seems a little bit less enthused than the other. <laughs> All right, let's see. Why don't we go ahead and take a break and then we'll go into kind of the ethics analysis. Yeah, 15 minute break. No, well, the, the reason I do my ask is so that I can have you to know that I didn't do this check box or whatever. You know, I make sure I'm the last one so I had to make one See, I review everything before I... Well, I do too. That's when I sign. But, but I'm old and I'm doing this stuff. I have this tap on my brain and it's like... I'll say things like, I swear you check that box. And I did. You know what I mean? I knew I was supposed to, but I didn't. So I review everything before I it, but then when it, when it, you know, I always make a statement with my head. I never sign before the red line and I just do that because they don't want something to do. Or, you know what I mean? And so, I probably should, but I don't. I review it and I see the I did it because I've got it right there. I know I got it. I know I and they will, it. you're right, sometimes they will say, I don't sell much. I don't sell much either. I'm not the real person. Because I got time to be on the committee. Ah! Anyway. <laughs> but no, um, I, sometimes they will ask you to change things. Yeah. And, I, and typically, I'll review it and I send it to them. And, and I always you know, say, okay, no, don't sign it and change it. We'll look it over good. And if there's anything you really need to change, let me know that. So I kind of have them do my job too. You know, I have them look it over. Then once they sign it, I can assume they look everything over and that's what they really intended to sign. And then I sign it. So, but that's the only reason I do that. Sometimes I can be careless, and that's me double checking. Like yeah. yeah. Most people right. are better to check back on the course. You know, not, you know, paperwork. Most people are more paperwork oriented. Oh, we saw one yesterday. Oh, you had not seen my work. We don't do math, we don't do that. Right. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. All right, guys, so I think we have uh, about an hour and 15, 18 minutes left if we're being Amy specific, so. <laughs> I don't know what she means. <laughs> um, so we're going to finish wrapping up, and I know this is kind of very grievance heavy. Um, like I said, it's important for, even if you don't serve on the grievance panel, to understand their role and what they're supposed to be looking for, because if something gets past them, the professional standards panel also needs to know to look for some of these issues if they appear. Um, so the ethics analysis um, during a grievance panel meeting is similar, but not exactly the same as the arbitration. So it's going to be the 180-day um, requirement that um, needs to be looked at by the panels is was the complaint filed within 180 days after the facts constituting the matter complained of could have been known within the exercise of reasonable due diligence, 
or within 180 days after the conclusion of the transaction, whichever is later. So that is kind of the 180-day guideline for grievance panels to be evaluating, similarly to arbitral issues with um, the arbitration analysis. If something is in front of a ethics hearing panel or even an arbitration hearing panel that appears to have been outside the guidelines of 180 days, that also falls to the hearing panel to consider dismissal if it's clearly outside that because that's another one of those um, areas that the panel no longer has authority because it's been filed outside the time limitation. And the big question to ask for ethics um, panels or grievance panels reviewing ethics complaints is, if the facts in the complaint are taken as, tr as given or as true, then is there a potential violation of the code of ethics? I know it's sometimes frustrating, and I know for many of our panels, they will get to the panels and they will say, how did this even get here? How did this happen? But please understand that this is what the grievance panel question is. The grievance panel receives only the, uh, the, the complaints. They do not receive the response. They are not there to determine if there is a violation because that's the role of the hearing panel. The grievance panel is there to determine, is there something here that we need to look into or that needs to be heard because there's a potential violation. They don't, they're not saying that there is a violation, but is there a potential? So it's a very, it's a pretty low threshold because we want to make sure that we're looking into anything that appears to maybe be inappropriate, a perceived violation. Ultimately speaking, it may not be. It may get to the hearing panel and it's there's no violation and that happens quite frequently. Not every complaint that's filed and goes to a hearing is there a violation. But the um, hearing panel, you know, please try to understand that grievance panel, they work really hard and this is their this is their question when moving it forward. Um, if there is a possible violation of the Code of Ethics, uh, currently the complaint is pushed forward to a professional standards panel for a hearing. Um, starting April 1st, as I alluded to earlier, we have our second policy, so it's going to be a busy time of the year for our professional standards group, both grievance, mediators, ombudsmen, hearing panelists. Starting April 1st, ethics complaints that allege a possible violation of the Code of Ethics will be reviewed to determine if the complaint is eligible to receive a citation. So the way the citation policy is gonna work, and this is, um, we adapted, so NAR has a NAR model citation policy, and they say that only these specific types of complaints can receive a citation. Our uh, professional standards subcommittee, which then went to the committee, which was then presented to the board of directors in September, said that we pared it down and said these, we wanna be even kind of more specific these limited areas may receive a citation. And the citation policy um, is often described similarly to receiving a speeding ticket. You did something, maybe you didn't necessarily realize you were doing it, you didn't necessarily realize you were speeding, but you were doing it. You didn't necessarily realize that you forgot to leave off like your realtor, you know, your, I can't even my you did something that you inadvertently, you're advertising, you inadvertently did something that, you know what, you didn't mean to, but you did it. Um, do you really wanna to go to a hearing and have this heard? Do you really need to go through this process to, like, most likely, I won't say always because it's the panel's decision, but to most likely have the outcome be what you know it's gonna be. And if you, if it's a citable offense, you can pay the citation, which every citable offense is $150 citation and a three hour code of ethics class. And you can do that and say, I accept it, and you can kind of move on. There's no hearing that it is what it, at that point is accepted the citation. So the grievance panel, in addition to all of their other tasks, <laughs> congratulations, guys, <laughs> uh, will now also have to review complaints that are, if they determine that this is a possible violation, then they have to take it one step further. Are these actions potentially citable offenses? So the citation policy. Um, Christine, yeah. question. Is there any consideration for uh, prior offenses in the... Yes. Yes. So if you have... Um, so the question was, is there, are there consideration of prior offenses? So the, uh, the policy that GAR has adopted is that um, no more than two citations in any 12-month period and three citations in a 24-month period. If you get more than that, you have to go to a hearing panel. And the hearing panel, as we'll get to, um, imposes a progressive discipline. And so those citations, if it's for the same reason, 
if it's for the state, now if you're cited for one thing, but then you make you have a citation for something else, that may, that, that that's going to be different because you it's speeding versus maybe rolling through a stop sign, but you it's only going to be considered for the same offense. If we find that you're doing the same offense over and over and over, you may if you're going to end up in front of a panel to consider that. So it is taken into consideration. But that would be separate from the group that filed the grievance. Against yeah, so the, so the complainant has no say in whether or not um, something is or is not said. They file it if it's, this is, this is my issue. If it goes to a hearing, they have to, att uh, they have to attend the hearing because they filed it. But if it's a citable offense and the respondent chooses to accept that citation, we've, the panel of professional standards, the board of directors by adopting it, has said that we at this point hope that you see your error You've taken the steps to address the fact that you've paid the fine to the association, that you've taken the code of ethics, and we hope that you know this means that you're not going to engage in this again. The complainant has nothing to do with that process besides the actual filing of it. But you notify the complainant. The complainant is notified of what happened of, in this process. So the complainant yeah. is aware of the citation yes. that it's made. The, the complainant would be aware if it's a, if if it the complainant is aware of the process as it happens. So if they file it with me. I am not the person that determines if something is or is not citable. That's the grievance panel. So they're aware that there could potentially be a citable offense and that there may be a citation and that's it. But they are all, they need to be, any complaint needs to be aware that they may in front of, end up in front of a hearing panel as they would currently. If a citation is made against me, does the person that filed the complaint, are they made aware? At, at yeah, so if, if, so if the question was, if a citation is made against a person and the person accepts that citation, is the complaint made aware? And the answer is yes. They would be made aware that the respondent chose to accept the citation. There's not going to be a hearing, and that is kind of what the complaint is notified of. Yeah. All right. So if the complaint lists only non-citable offenses, so starting April 1st, um, then the complaint is moved forward for a hearing, as it typically would be. Um, if the complaint lists both citable and non-citable offenses, then the complaint is moved forward for a hearing, as it currently would be. <laughs> so citations are only issued when the complaint lists only citable offenses. A grievance panel is not going to parse through this part needs to be given a citation, but this part needs to be in front of a panel. If there's anything that's not citable, it goes to a panel, regardless of the fact of the fact there might there might be also some citable offenses. It either all moves forward or none of it moves forward. For a hearing. So, for example, Article One could be a citable offense, but Article Two is has to go forward for a hearing. So the question was, if there's, let's say, for example, Article One and Article Two, um, and I didn't include what is and is not citable. We'll get to that. Um, so let's say Article One, for all intents and purposes at this moment, is citable, but Article Two is not citable. If both of those are listed, and the grievance panel says there's a, a potential violation of both of those. The entire complaints move forward. We're not giving a citation for Article One and having it here for Article Two. Right. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. So, um, and the respondent is always going to have the right to respond and request a hearing. Um, so, if you get this, if you get the citation and you say absolutely not, this is still somehow misconstrued. This is not what they're they're portraying it as. I want to go to a hearing, I want my name cleared. The respondent always, always, always has that right to go to a hearing as he would now. Um, so the respondent's options are to respond and request a hearing or to accept the citation by paying the fine, which is $150, and fulfilling the required discipline, which is a three-hour code of ethics um, course. And if the respondent ignores it altogether, um, just as it would be now, there's a potential membership violation mm -hmm. because as Article 14 states, you willingly slash begrudgingly agree to participate in these proceedings. So the respondent, regardless of you know whether it's a citation or not, whether it's a citable citation or a, a regular complaint that's moving forward to a hearing, has to respond. Um, so these are some of the, so these are the citable offenses that the board of directors has adopted um, as part of our citation program. Um, to kind of get a little bit of background into our subcommittee's thinking, the subcommittee, when determining what should and should not be citable, wanted to adopt things or adopt these specific types of actions as citable because these, for the most part, are things that are not easily are not 
open to interpretation as to what the action was. If the buyer allowed their client or the buyer access property, you know, not in compliance with the listing agent's agreement or terms, that they put in the MLS, that they told them over the phone, there's not a lot of, there's no, and for the most part, not a lot of room for dispute. So the agent can say, okay, you know what, I did it. I'm sorry, I'll accept the citation. So most of these we try to, or not we, the subcommittee and the panel try to select the um, actions that were not necessarily going to create a lot of dispute or room for kind of a misunderstanding of the facts as two agents may understand them. So like I said, the first one, I'm not going to read all of these to you, I think, and I will say for the grievance panel, if you'll notice, is there um, a lot of articles are, are supported by standards of practices. This is all, the only article one in there is these accessing or using or allowing others to use or access property managed or listed on terms other than those authorized by the owner or seller. So that is the only article one type of violation. Now there's lots and lots and lots and lots of article one violations. So only this type of article one violation is citable. So the grievance panel, like I said, it's, you guys have a really, really important role. So if it's something else, article one, the buyer or the, the agent did submit my offer, they were not for my best interest, it's article one, but this is not, it's not a citable article. It's, it's not this action. So that's kind of for the, for those of you guys who are not to kind of understand, it's very specific. It's not entire articles. Um, so yeah, so then the next one is, um, like I said, you guys, um, it's all in your packet, I believe, the failure to communicate a change in compensation for cooperative services prior to submitting an offer. Um, when a listing broker attempts to unilaterally modify compensation. Um, yeah. um, failing to disclose the existence of accepted offers. Um, providing access, so this kind of goes hand in hand with the very first one, Article 1. Yes. Are these citable offenses established by, were these established by NAR? Yes. yes. So this yes. Every, every, everywhere in NAR. This, these are the offenses. Yeah, so the question was um, who established these? These are NAR's model citations. So we basically, we didn't modify, what we, the, what we modified is that we took a subset of their entire <laughs> list of citable offenses and adopted them the way that they put them out there. Some states, I will say, NAR modeled their model citation policy after some states who already implemented a citation policy. So those states may have a different citation policy, but those that came after, especially those that are modeled after NAR's model citation are these. So we did not kind of go through and pick and choose and decide certain types of actions um, without the guidance of um, the model citation policy from NAR. Um, so we have that, uh, failing to disclose status as a real estate professional, um, advertising property without authority, failing to disclose um, the name of a firm and advertisement for listed property. Yes. I'm sorry to stop you. Okay. The first one, advertising property for sale or lease without authority of the owner or listing broker. Um, what about coming soon? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that viable if they if they don't have? I mean, in other words, what you're saying is if they if they have spoken to a seller perhaps, but they don't have a written listing agreement yet, and they're they're. They're advertising. putting out there on social media that I've got, you know, coming soon and with an address. Um, so the question was coming soon, and I think this is the question. Is or, that viable? Yeah. I'm just curious. Um, I would say honestly that if, if this came up and someone filed a coming soon, obviously it would depend on what else got in front of the grievance panel because not all coming soon in and of itself is unethical or in violation of Article 12. Yeah. But if you, yeah, so it, I think it's going to depend. So coming but, soon itself, the answer is no. Coming, just because you have coming soon does not mean it's going to be subject to the citation because it doesn't mean it's even subject to Article 12. Um, I think that, you know, and, you know, this may, if someone does file a like coming soon, maybe kind of shows that they didn't necessarily have the authority of the owner or the listing broker to do that, um, then yeah, you might, you know, that's, I think coming soon, if you don't have the authority to, advertise on this property coming soon or not, you're going to run into some Article 12 so, issues. So you really need to already have it listed. Well, uh, but not necessarily, yeah. because it could be 
not listed, but they could have given you written authority to tell people that it's coming soon, right? I mean, I guess it depends on the fact. Yeah, I just, like I said, just because you got to do a coming soon doesn't make it in violation of the law. Obviously, it can be, but it doesn't make it such automatically. Michael? And coming soon actually is more of an MLS violation than it is a code of ethics violation. So you have to go to your MLS rules and look at those to see if you need to file a complaint with the MLS. So the response was that coming soon a lot of times are MLS issues. Um, so thank goodness. The listing was signed. They are getting Yeah. That's if the listing was signed. Yeah, if the yeah. listing was signed, FMLS requires 48 hours to right. be in their system. But if the listing was not signed, then it's a, it's a different violation, it's a different yeah. Violation. There are a lot of different things that come yeah. into play. Yeah. yeah. Well, so okay. say, I think that's all to say that coming soon does not necessarily mean that you're going to be in violation sorry. of our I, I, I really should yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, and then, up a can. <laughs> yes. Can you Two tell words. me what the coming soon, how you can get away with that, or how you can, I mean, I know. <laughs> <laughs> how you can get away with that. Uh, it's, it's, a whole yeah. it's a whole I'm different thing. I'm going to say that I, I'm going to say the law. this is not, this is how this process works. Now, what, <laughs> this is how this process works. I am not here to necessarily tell you how to or not get, you know, there's, your MLS has, your MLS may or may not have some processes in place for coming soon. All I'm going to say about the code of ethics in our process is that just because you have a coming soon does not mean you're going to be in violation of Article 12. You right. could be, right. Here, but it's not so automatic. If yes. anybody's got a question of coming soon stuff after this class is over, I'll tell you how the commission looks at it. There you go. Thank you. We'll the class after the class. Not that. Not the class after the class. Um, yeah. And then um, the other side of offense is the failure to disclose your status as the landlord owner and, and realtor or licensee when advertising on just your own property. Um, falsely claiming to have sold property, misleading consumers through deceptive framing, manipulating content, diverting internet traffic, presenting users content without attribution permission or other misleading images. I don't really know how to do that personally, but some of you guys out there are probably pretty tech savvy. So, yeah. Um, registering or using deceptive URL or domain names, one of those other things that yeah, and then conditioning submission of a buyer's offer on additional compensation, uh, placing sale or lease signs on property without permission. Okay. So those are all the citable offenses. So like you said, not every action is going to be citable. Not every action that may even fall under a particular article is going to be citable. So um, it's going to be. The agreements panel, more more than ever, I know, is going to ha have a lot of important work to do, a lot of really important hard work. Um, it's going to be a learning experience for all of us as we kind of get through this, but um, this is going to be your analysis after, for complaints received April 1st and beyond is, you know, currently, it's, is there a potential violation of the Code of Ethics if the facts are assumed to be true? If the answer is yes, you move on. Um, the next step, starting April 1st, is going to be, is there a possible violation of the Code of Ethics? If no, then toss it out, we'll move on. If yes, the next question is, um, are there, is the complaint citable? If it's citable and non-citable, we'll move it on. If it's just the citation, then we'll have to issue the, we'll issue the citation to the respondent, along, like I said, with the right for them to respond and go to a hearing. Yes? Is the fixed, um uh, is the signable a fixed fee of $150? That's not. Yes. yes. So the discipline, rather than trying to assign at this moment, you know, this is a new program that we're, a new policy we're putting in place. Rather than saying, you know what, for this offense we're going to do 150, and for this offense it's going to be 250 with the class. All the everything we felt was pretty straightforward. Nothing necessarily is worse than the other, and so the um, subcommittee recommended, and it was adopted by the full committee and board of directors, that it's a $150 fee right. as well as um, the, the class. Is this going to be put in some sort of chart or form? Yeah. So this will be given um, with, to the grievance panel with, their, with all of their other materials, the code of ethics, their checklist. This will be provided to them to kind of review and. You know, we'll, it'll probably be a few meetings of kind of learning of what the most efficient way to get through this is, but I will absolutely make sure that all of um, you guys as participants have this information to um, kind of use as a guide. And the board has received a letter that the person, that the respondent has received a citation. 
Senator? Did the board would receive the letter that day. Yeah, so I, as the, the GAR administering, will obviously know that the, local, uh, the respondent has, oh, so the question was, um, do the boards receive notice that um, someone's received a citation? And the answer is yes, the yes. local board does. The local board, because we do that, we administer this on behalf of the local board, the local board is still receiving all of the outcomes of our, um, you know, whether they're hearing, citations, et cetera. So they would be notified, the local board would be notified. Okay, um, any questions on citations before we move on? Anything on video landing? Okay. Um, Chair, right now, I can't remember if they were on earlier. When we just asked them if there's any students there that we don't have. Chair, are you are you are you there? Are you guys good? In Cherokee? I don't know. Um, tell them we don't have video of them. Oh, we don't see any video. Let's see. And, sure. and it may be that they just signed on and they don't have students now. Okay. Double check. All right. So well, hopefully, Cherokee, you're there. Okay, so the grievance panel um, always has the right to dismiss. If it's a non arbitrable issue, filed up in 180 days, the facts don't, um, the facts alleged aren't a possible violation of the Code of Ethics. Um, so if the grievance panel dismisses it, I will let the complaint know your ethics complaint, your arbitration request has been dismissed, and you will have 20 days to file an appeal. As I mentioned earlier, all of the any complaint or request that comes in that is dismissed by the grievance panel is given an opportunity, is given one opportunity to, to be appealed. So they have 20 days to file that with me. And of course it would be reviewed by a different grievance panel. We don't want the same panel that dismissed it initially reviewing it again to, you know, to have the same outcome. So it will be reviewed by a different grievance panel. Does the second panel know the first yeah. panel? Yes, yeah, so the second, the second panel is made aware because they, they have, um, I think it's form E13 and E or A14. I can't remember um, form number specifically, but they have to fill out the appeal because they, they have to submit with it. So they are notified that it was dismissed, but they are to make their own um, judgment based on is there a potential violation. Yeah, because it comes as an appeal. Yes, it is an appeal. Yes. Refresh my memory. If it outside of the 180 days, does that count against them? So the 180 days stops or is, uh, is stalled once it's filed with me. So any 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 time frames afterwards is um, doesn't count against them. So if they file with me on the 179th day and I receive it at GAR, it doesn't get to the grievance panel to the 190th day. It's dismissed and then it's appealed. And so on the 210th day, they you know it's that's absolutely acceptable because it's filed and received by me within 180. Right, so the grievance panel, the, so the question is the type of review that the second grievance panel makes um, if it's been dismissed by the first grievance panel. So the second grievance panel is given the appeal so that they understand why the complaining party feels that the first panel got it wrong mm -hmm. and it needs to move forward, but they're still, they're, they're passed with the same question as the first panel. If taken as true on its face, is there a possible violation? Um, so with drawn ethics complaints, um, we you know get some sometimes. Sometimes um, once a respondent receives um, a complaint, they want to do everything that they can at that point to make it better. And sometimes it works. I mean, many times it doesn't, which is why we still have hearings. But sometimes it does work. Um, and if it's withdrawn, if the parties work it out, whether it's maybe with an ombudsman, maybe the parties want to say, I think we can work it out, but we need someone to help an ombudsman. I'll get someone involved, or maybe like I said the Respondent gets this complaint and like realizes how upset that the complaining party really was, and they try to make it better after the fact. Maybe it's successful. They apologize, fix the situation, and then the complaining party withdraws the complaint with me. So all withdrawn complaints still must be approved by the grievance panel. The grievance panel moved it forward, so the grievance panel must approve uh, the final withdrawal or the dismissal. So it will go back to the grievance panel for review. The grievance panel can only move the complaint forward when there's a potential violation of public trust as defined by NAR. So a lot of times, so if we have, you know, a buyer that says, 
files Article 9 and says, I didn't get my buyer brokerage agreement, you know, it, when I signed it, it took too long to send it to me, I'm really, really upset with my broker, the broker gets the complaint because we moved it forward on the grievance panel. And the broker realizes, well, they're really upset, I didn't think it was a big deal, but I'm very, very sorry. They call, they apologize, and the complaint, you know what, is fine with that. That's what they wanted to hear. They don't want to go to this hearing in front of the panel, but they got what they got the acknowledgement of the wrongdoing, and so they withdraw the complaint. The grievance panel, they that is they can only withdraw with a violation of public trust. Let me pull those up. So, and it's in your paperwork or your um, what is defined as public trust: misappropriation of client funds or property, willful discrimination, or fraud resulting in substantial economic harm. So, if an action doesn't fall under those three, the grievance panel needs to dismiss it. We don't want, even though there's there's clearly a violation of Article, clearly, quote unquote, a violation of Article 9 because the buyer broker agreement wasn't sent upon the signing, mm -hmm. if the parties are able to work that out and they're able to maintain relationships, that's what we want them to do. Unless, like I said, it's one of these, what NAR wants to cause the really, really bad actions, one of these three actions, the grievance panel should be dismissing it. So even though the grievance panel might they say that this broker acted carelessly, you know, an apology should be enough. They should have had to take a class to really understand that's not the role of the grievance panel to decide. The role is to decide whether or not the action has been with whether or not the action that's being withdrawn is one of these three things. And if it is, then the grievance panel can move forward as a new complaint. If it's one of these three things. Um, so before we move on to kind of like the hearing part for this, just sort of on panels, do you guys have any questions about? Withdrawn complaints, violations of public trust, etc. Anything in video, Annie? Any real quick? Yes. Uh, on the last slide, the, the third reason, fraud resulting in substantial economic harm. That could be pretty scary. So, are there is, are there uh, instances where the grievance committee, a grievance committee, has seen? Oh my goodness, this is actually not just a code of violence. Code of ethics violations, even more so than the standards of practices, what do they do at that point if they have discovered that discovered? So, because that third one could be, sounds to me like it could be. Yeah, so the question was for especially this third one on the list of um, potential violations of public trust, fraud resulting in substantial economic harm. So, if it comes back to the grievance panel as having been withdrawn and they determine, you know what, they forged signatures, they did all this, I mean, they yeah, even though they paid back the money when the complaint came in, they paid back the money to the person complaining as to keep them quiet and move on. Um, if they see this, the, the grievance panel steps in as a new complainant. Because at the end of the day, the grievance panel has, can never make a determination that there has been a violation. That is the role of the hearing panel. So they step in, and if at the hearing panel, they determine that there is a potential violation of public trust, there's been the violation as alleged, um, and they, in the hearing panel, decides or determines that there's not only a violation of the article, but there's a potential violation of public trust. Then they have the right to recommend to the board of directors, not the board of directors, the executive committee, which approves the decisions, that we submit the, the decision to the commission and allow them, if they wish, to pursue it. Any other questions? So would that be considered outside of our scope? Or um, I mean, I think that if, if someone's were taking, you know, the last one, fraud resulting in substantial um, economic harm by forging signatures to kind of, you know, take money or whatnot, I don't necessarily think that's outside the scope. That's those are a lot. There's probably lots of violations of the code of ethics. It may be by the time that someone else is done with them, it doesn't really matter what discipline we impose, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't want to hear it. Well, I mean, if there, if there's, if it, I think if someone submits the documentation that shows that there's fraud, and our grievance panel thinks that this should not be dismissed because even though you've made the person whole, and there's enough here for the grievance panel to step in and take that role, I think that that is appropriate, and especially depending on if it, I mean, if it's clearly fraud, the grievance panel also is not going to step in for the most part unless it's clearly one of these things. Um, when it gets to the, well, when it gets to the, so uh, Faith's point is, what happens when it gets to the hearing panel? Well, fraud resulting in substantial economic harm doesn't fall under one article. So it's probably a lot of articles that address this, and we can still hear those articles. 
And then the hearing panel also then has the right to say, we recommend that there's a violation of this, this, and this based on the findings. But also based on the findings, we believe that there is substantial fraud, or there's a fraud resulting in substantial economic harm. And upon that finding, they have to put that in their decision. That decision, if approved by the executive committee, is then forwarded on to the commission. So it was, the hearing itself would be within our scope to hear, as far as the articles, which articles it touches on. Would you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, um, how do we handle, because fraud resulting in substantial economic harm is not one specific article. So the question is, how do we address that potential violation of public trust? And the answer is, you know, whether or not it's the grievance panel moving it forward, or maybe the complainant still moves it forward, that there's this fraud. And the there's going to be other articles I touch on. It's probably going to be Article 1, maybe Article 8, Article 9. Yeah, there's a lot of Article 2. It's a lot of articles that may touch on this that the hearing panel's role is to say, we believe there's a violation of 1 because of you were forging signatures. We believe there's a violation of Article 8 because you were embezzling money. And to address that, and then at the end, if they feel strong enough in the decision, what they'll say is, and we believe not only is it a violation of these articles, we also believe that there's a potential violation of public trust. And if that is part of the decision and it is approved um, by the board, uh, excuse me, by the executive committee, the decision is then forwarded on to the commission to let them investigate or do what they need to do on their end, in case it's something very, very serious, as one of these three things are. So, Christine, if, it, if that, first off, all of those are violations of license law. Right. Um, so it goes back to executive and they say, yes, this needs to be forwarded on. Does, does GAR become the requester in the investigation then? Um, I believe that, uh, I believe it's GAR's executive committee. I would have to double check that. We have not had, luckily, I mean, I don't know, luckily or not, I, I, since I've been here, we have not had something that has been determined to be a violation of public trust. We've had some very serious complaints come in but nothing to the point where we've had to board it on. But my understanding is, is if a panel were to believe that and then it is approved, that decision is approved by the executive committee. I believe it's JR's executive committee that would be the requester. But I, I would have to double check on that. Okay. Um, so the next part is scheduling a hearing. Um, so similarly to scheduling, so now that we've gotten out of kind of grievance, I know that was a lot of information. Um, scheduling a hearing is done by me. I'll coordinate with the parties, the potential panelists, the local board, AE, if I need to go to you know, DeKalb or Columbus, Cherokee. We'll coordinate those um, to make sure that everyone is on the same page about when we'll have this. Um, that's going to be based on my availability, uh, chairperson and panelist availability, obviously boardroom and party availability. So um, that's, and those, yeah, those are all considerations. And then, of course, we want to make sure that if someone has counsel or witnesses that, you know, we give them enough notice to make sure that we can um, accommodate them. Obviously, sometimes we've had, well, not sometimes, but several times you have to reschedule because someone has a conflict that arises. And, you know, we try to be flexible, but we will not continue, slash I will not continue to postpone and postpone and postpone at some point, especially when it's four to eight weeks in advance. If your calendar is free now, you need to ensure that your witnesses, your counsel, whoever it is, can be there. So, out of respect for everyone involved. <laughs> so the purpose of the hearing is to hear from all the parties in the dispute, um, to determine who is entitled to the commission or fees in dispute, or determine whether or not there was a violation of the code of ethics by the respondents. So those are that's the role of um, those who serve on hearing panels. Um, unlike the grievance panel, the hearing panels will be hearing from everyone. They'll be hearing from the complainant, the respondent, the witnesses, whereas the grievance panel, like I said earlier, they only receive the file of the complaints. Um, things to remember during the hearing, um, it's always the complainant that holds the burden of proof for proving his or her case. Um, let's see. I know it's difficult at times, but the panelists really need to be cautious about asking leading questions, because this goes back to the first point that it's the complainant's job to prove their case, not the panelist's job. The panel is there to determine, based on what was presented to them, whether or not there's a, a violation, not to make the case for a violation, or make the case for a not violation. What if you add articles <laughs> So adding articles can be done during a hearing. Um, what would typically be done, because the, if the grievance panel, what I do, 
excuse me, curing panel. What I typically do, still murder degree with panels, is I provide the materials ahead of time because I would like to make sure that the panelists know what to expect in the hearing. I don't want anyone to feel rushed to have to get through sometimes hundreds of pages of material in a very short period of time. So what a lot of times happens is that a panel may come in and say, I think that there might be another article that the grievance panel didn't add that the complaint didn't realize you know, was also a potential violation. The complainant really, or the hearing panel, um, at any point prior to executive session, can always add an article. However, when adding an article, the respondent at that point is always given the option to postpone the hearing in order to prepare for that new article because you always have to give the respondent the right to prepare the defense. And if I'm only preparing for Article 1, but then all of a sudden you told me now I've also violated potentially Article 12 with my advertising, I may not have brought anything to address that. So some respondents may say, let's just do it now, we'll add it, we'll hear it, we'll discuss it, Let's move on, but some respondents rightfully have, will say, let's postpone it, I didn't know this was coming, I didn't understand, and let's reschedule, and they are given that right. I guess my question is, because we have done this before, we've added articles, but if we can't ask leading questions, then how, I mean, if we're adding in the article right before it, and the complaint doesn't really have the burden of proof to prove that their case on that, who does that? Yeah, so the question was, you know, if, if the, the hearing panel has the right at any point, except prior to the executive session, to add potential articles, um, and I think that it should be based on what was presented to you. Um, you know, if you, yeah, I, th I, I think that the answer to that is, this is what was presented to you, this is what you heard. If you, if during the hearing, because the hearing panel can add, like I said, any point prior to the dismiss, like I said, the respondent will be given the chance to say, I need to take a break, let's postpone because I need to prepare for my defense for this. But if you hear during a hearing, well, I didn't, no, of course I didn't present that offer. I think you can go into executive session and say maybe we need to add an article that addresses the fact that he didn't so what do that. The, what the complaint file should prove the additional article. It should at least, yeah, it, it, should, it, it, should, it should allude to that. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure that you're asking relevant questions, obviously. Um, it's important to watch your demeanor during a hearing. Sometimes I know, and I really appreciate all of you guys, grievance panel, professional students panel, you know, this process works because we have so many volunteers who are really committed to the code of ethics and code of ethics enforcement. I, my job is administrative for, most part, for the most part. So I really appreciate you guys, and I know that sometimes you're hearing things, whether it's from the complaint, whether it's from the respondent, and you're just throwing your hands up, like, can't believe you're here, like, what a waste of time, or you're thinking, my God, like, is this really happening? Did this agent really do? But it's important to watch your demeanor, because when a party leaves at the end of the hearing, they should really not have an idea of what you're gonna decide, at least not based on your demeanor, maybe based on, you know, how the ultimate, they may have a feeling, I may not prevail on this, you know, I didn't, but it should never be because you, your actions, made them feel like you were already against them. So it's really important to watch your demeanor. Yes? Can you give an example of an inappropriate leading question? And, okay, so the question was um, inappropriate leading questions. Um, I think for me, what I, and I, because a lot of times as I, I sit in all the hearings, and so I don't always know what's gonna be asked, obviously, since I just sit there and watch. An inappropriate leading question, I think, uh, what I would caution my panelists to avoid are, well, didn't you think that this, you should have done this? Or why didn't you do it this way? You know, why, things that sound almost accusatory. You know, was it like, didn't you think that something was, yeah, didn't you think this? Because I think that goes to show, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, certain questions, I think certain questions may show that you are a little bit biased and may show that you've already made your decision. And so, Yes, I mean that would. I think that you know, I think that it's important. And you may be thinking it, and you know what? It's it, it, yeah. It, and, and I know it's hard, especially if you guys are volunteers. So and this is for all of you guys wouldn't be part of this process if you guys didn't take these sort of things very seriously. And some of the things you're going to hear on these panel panels, you're just going to think, my, you know, can we? 
can they not even be a role? Can we just, you know, like <laughs> exile? Them? You're gonna hear things, but it's still your role. As, it's, that, that person is still entitled to have what they to have a fair hearing and to make sure that the people who are listening to them are not outwardly biased against them. And so, if, you know, I think a question like, well, didn't you think that this you should have done it this way? Is did you do it this way? And if the answer is no. And maybe a why, you know, why not? But it doesn't need to kind of go down the down the path of reprimanding them. So keep your opinion out of it. Don't be judgmental. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Don't be judgmental. Don't. I mean, don't be. Yeah. Keep your opinion of what you think is right and wrong. And that's what executive session is for, guys. We go off record and I mean, just let it out then, but not in front of the parties. Yeah. I mean, because like I said, there's going to be times where there's a lot of thoughts, and you guys, it's. it's you guys have to, you know, remember that you are part of this proceeding. And if you don't give someone a fair hearing, whether or not they rob this person blind, if you guys were already biased in your manners and your questions, that's grounds for appeal. Mm -hmm. Whether or not the person is, the you know, the worst person in the world and has done all these horrible things, they have that right. And so we want to make sure that we treat all persons, regardless of what we maybe think about their actions, fairly. In that regard, um, so arbitration and involving procuring cause, which is going to be a lot of our our arbitration hearings, um, procuring cause as defined by NAR is the initiation of the unbroken chain of causal events that results in a successful transaction defined as a sale that closes or a lease that is executed. Um, there is no threshold rule, and the fact that a Agents may have a signed buyer brokerage agreement, and many times irrelevant. So it's important, but it's really a lot of times what it ends up being is it's important because your buyer signed it, and now your buyer issued the commission, not necessarily the listing agent or the other co-op agent that was paid. So what I tell, what I do tell parties when they come to me about when they request arbitration and they discuss, you know, is it worth it? Should we uh, go to mediation? What I do encourage them to the reason why I think mediation is so important is when you have this initiation of the unbroken chain of events, chain of causal events, I think everyone, including those who sit on the panel, are going to have a different perspective. You know, everyone, and a lot of times, you know, especially because you guys never do anything wrong, you guys are all the perfect realtor, it's the buyer that's going to place you in the situation that has, you know, gone between buyer, buyer's agent, the buyer's agent, maybe even went directly to the listing agent and has to get the best deal for themselves, and all of a sudden they're in this position of, you know, what do I do? And so this is, everyone's gonna view it a little bit differently, and this is where mediation is so important, and you can, it can help the parties reach maybe a resolution where they're both happy, because everyone's gonna think that chain starts at a different point, or some people may think the chain is broken at a different point, some people may think that the chain starts with one, started with one person, so it's not always black and white. So that's the importance I think of mediation and why I always encourage parties to attempt mediation. Um, so do you guys have any questions about that? Recurring cause, no threshold rule, why our brokerage agreement may or be pretty irrelevant to procuring cause. Okay. Um, so we have um, what's next is the burden of proof. So the complainant and um and the, Let's see, arbitration has a preponderance of the evidence burden of proof to show. So the, per, the party that files the arbitration request, their burden of proof is basically 51% or more. I have to show with a 51, with just barely a greater certainty that I was the procuring cause, that I am the, you know, I should be awarded these fees because of the contractual dispute we have. That's what the panel must go we're not quite, you know, it's one of those, and that's, like I said, going back to why mediation is so important, it's 51%, a gr just a slightly bit more likely that this person is, in fact, a procuring cause, this person, in fact, you know, is due the fees from the contractual dispute. Um, ethics is a little bit of a stronger um, threshold. It's clear, strong, and convincing. So when someone alleges an article, um, and in the hearing, you're going to go through each article. So someone may allege one, two, three, and six, and you're going to go through each article. There may be no violations of any of them. There may be violations of all of them, or there may be violations of some of them. 
But for each article, the hearing panel needs to decide whether or not the evidence presented by the complainant clearly, strongly, and convincingly shows the panel that there is a violation of that article by the respondent. Um, so in executive session, arbitrations, one of my favorites, are no finding of facts. So um, typically with ethics, there will be a finding of facts with an arbitration. It's just a signed document, and we kind of move on once they make their decision. Um, as we kind of alluded to earlier, realtors are only found in violation of the Code of Ethics, or articles of the Code of Ethics. They are not found in violations of the standards of practices or of the, you know, the, we do have case interpretations as well that are policy of NAR. Um, while you are not found in violation of that, you can, that can be used in support of whether or not you violated the article. So a decision may read, you're found in violation of Article 1 as supported by standard practice 1-3, and you know, it'll say what it says, and your, your actions may be similar to that of 1-3, and because of that, you have now violated, you know, they find you in violation of Article 1. Um, both uh, standards of practices as well as case interpretations are official policy of NAR. Okay, yeah, so in um, executive session, this is your big question for ethics. Was there a violation of the articles alleged to have been charged in executive? So as we said earlier, you can add an article to the complaint at any point prior to executive session. Obviously, if you add it during the hearing, the respondent needs to be given the chance to postpone if they wish to prepare. However, there is no addition of an article during executive session. At that point, the hearing is over. There's no more discussion, determination, you know, defense of an additional article. Nothing can be added at that point. So it's only the articles alleged. Um, things to remember, and I think that this is something that's difficult, um, and I know that it's kind of sometimes hard to wrap your mind around at times, is that violations of the Code of Ethics do not have to be intentional. Um, I think that most of our violations that get in front of us are probably not intentional. Most of them probably don't even realize that they violate the Code of Ethics. They didn't mean to. Most of them are not doing something to try and get around, the code, you know, um, to find ways to be sneaky about it. It just, they didn't realize, or something happened, and yes, I know I should have sent that agreement sooner, but, you know, I got caught up in the day, and it ran away, and I just, it was an accident. I know it can be hard at times to remember that, but violations of the Code of Ethics do not need to be intentional to be found in violation. Um, most of our violations are accidents or unintentional. Um, if the code of ethics was accidentally or mistakenly violated, um, that's, that should be reflected in the discipline that's imposed. So if you misadvertise something in the MLS, you know, you said something was, and I don't even, I don't, we don't have an MLS, I don't even know what the, Love. yeah, there's a lot of things in the MLS, but if something was actually, you know, was, mis was misrepresented, in theory, you know, that very potentially an Article 12 violation, which says that you're gonna advertise things truthfully and honestly, and if you didn't, you know, maybe it was an accident, maybe you didn't double check it, you know, that can be reflected in the discipline. There may still be a violation, but that can then be reflected in the discipline. Um, so disciplining a realtor. So if during the executive session, the hearing determines that a respondent violated one or more of the articles of the Code of Ethics, the panel must determine the appropriate discipline, if any. And so notice that it does say if any, and we'll kind of get to that list in a moment. Um, hearing panels should consider previous violations and sanctions, and um, when we have the citation policy implemented, that will include citations as well. Um, so there is, oh, not sure. okay, so um, I think there does um, continue to say this, so you should consider previous violations and sanctions. Um, it, the hearing panel is tasked with giving progressive discipline. So what basically happens is if there's a violation, if I have respondent one who has been brought to me in a hearing and he's been found in violation before, the hearing panel at that point is not gonna be told 
prior to a prior to executive session that he's already been in front of the panel because I'm not I out of having a fair hearing for that person for that respondent because he may not be in violation this time he may have been in violation the first time but not the second time and so the hearing panel does not need to know about the previous violation as they're determining whether or not there has been a violation as that may lead them to think well you know maybe then he just needs to kind of learn because people are still complaining about him if during, once during executive session you determine that yes, he is in violation again, if it's the same article, then at that point I will say, well, you know, he, Mr. Smith has been brought from a panel and has been found to have been in bio, violation of article one just like this time, just like you guys are finding. And the way progressive discipline works is, well, what did that last panel, how did they discipline them? Maybe it was a class, maybe it was just a letter of warning, maybe there was a fine, and progressive discipline means, well, this time he didn't understand that it was that this action was a violation of Article One, and the two hundred and fifty dollar fine in the class clearly didn't do it for him. Mm -hmm. So this time we're going to impose maybe a five hundred or a thousand dollar fine, and we're going to make him take more classes. You know, and, and that's what progressive discipline is. So we want to make sure that, especially because, like I said, most of these complaints are coming in. They're not intentional. Most of the respondents get in front of the panel and they don't want to be there. They didn't, you know, they didn't mean to get there. They, and this is their opportunity to say, the first, mm -hmm. on the first instance, especially depending on you know, the, whether it was intentional or not, it can be a very minimal discipline. It can be classes, it can be, you know, code of ethics. And if you, now you take code of ethics every two years. So you might be doing you a favor anyway. But, um, and then the panel, you know, especially if you do progressive discipline, you're permitted to provide rationale for the, deci um, the decision of the type of discipline imposed. Okay. Um, so the types of discipline include no discipline. So if something is, you know, there was a violation, but you know what, it was just clearly you came in, you tried to mitigate the issue quickly, you are clearly remorseful, the panel can say, you know what, this was, yes, there was a violation, but you know what, no discipline. I think you got the point. Let's move on. But that still goes in the record, right? Yeah, that would still go, yeah. But all, I will say, for the, even for the discipline, even for those that are not found in violation, that decision is still sent to the local board for them to keep on record. And the record is completely confidential, so if someone calls me and says, hey, so, so you know, I want to check in on agent so-and-so, do they have any violations? I, I respond with, I cannot confirm nor deny that. That is information that I cannot give you. So there's no discipline. There is a letter of warning or reprimand um, that's, that can be placed in the Rolls-Royce file. It's a standard period of three years. Um, continuing education classes. A fine not to exceed $15,000. I think that was bumped up a few years, maybe three or four years ago by NAR. It used to be 5,000. Apparently, some realtors in some other parts of the world would just pay five thousand dollar fines and move on. So I don't know. Yeah, another part of the yeah, another part. Apparently, five. Okay, apparently, they would pay the five thousand dollar fine and mark it off as the cost of doing business. I'm not going to do this. So you know what? So be it. Um, they upped it to fifteen thousand. I don't know if they're now paying those fifteen thousand dollar fines as well there. But um, I am happy to say that for the you know. For the most part, there are fines imposed by GAR, but we have not had anything serious enough to get even close to that fifteen thousand. <laughs> um, a suspension of membership um, between thirty days and one year can also be imposed. Um, if the, you know, and when I get in front of a panel or not, and when we're in executive session, we're talking about the um, various types of memberships. I tend to let them know when they ask you know, what is standard. Suspension and expulsion of realtor memberships are things that should really be done you know, in very serious cases, and we have suspended before. We've never expelled since I've been here. I'm sure it's been done before. But suspension is, um, has been done in very serious cases, but you know, this is someone's you know, right, right to even practice potentially with a company, if they're a realtor company. So we don't take that lightly. Um, also, um, if you are a local board that um, has um, an MLS, you can also suspend or terminate MLS rights and privileges. That is not a GAR option as we can't suspend, we don't have an MLS to suspend anyone's rights um, or privileges, but that is an option if you are. Yes, Bert? If the company is suspended membership, 
because of one agent's activity, does that affect the membership of all the agents in the company? Um, no, so, if a mem so a member may have to pay, so we do have a non-member's dues fee actually, so if they want to stay with that company and they are, their membership is suspended, they may, the company may ask them to pay the non-member's dues fee, then mem the member may have to leave, but unless it is the qualifying broker, the designated realtor, who has been suspended, the company is fine. Now, now if the company, as a realtor company, if the realtor company's designated realtor is the one who's misusing funds, doing something, and we, and he's the one who's brought in front of us, that designated realtor, um, we say, you know what, this this was real bad. You're either going to be suspended for a year, or maybe we we're going to even expel you. You were, like I said, embezzling funds or whatever. Um, that affects every member. That affects every agent in his company because if he can't be a realtor with his qualifying um, designated realtor status, none of his agents can. So it's only when it's the designated realtor that um, who's registered with the association. If he's the one brought up and he's the one expelled, then unless they put in a new person, they can put in someone else in that role. But if he's the only one who's qualified to be in that designated realtor role, then every agent in his company can no longer be a realtor. Yes, Barbara? Is Barbara on mute? Christina, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Christina, I want to ask a question about this letter of warning, uh, the letter of reprimand. Yes. Where is that letter from? It is sold into the realtor's file, but is who, which file? And does the broker get a copy of it? So the broker, the designated realtor, and I will say, the, I use the term designated realtor because sometimes lots of companies have, you know, different, you know, there's a qualifying broker, there's other office brokers, managers. I go by whoever is the designated realtor, which is not always a qualifying broker, but usually an office manager or someone on file. So the designated realtor is copied on all communications with the respondent. So they would be given a copy of the decision as well as the a copy of the letter of warning or reprimand. That letter of warning or reprimand stays in my file with GAR, with the decision. And that is also sent to the local board with the decision to um, be kept in their file. Does that answer your question, Barbara? Thank you. Of course. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so on here we also have, um, why is this I'm so close? Yeah, I know. I, okay, so we, um, regarding the potential discipline of a realtor, um, the hearing panel can recommend one or a combination. So it doesn't just have to be a letter of warning or just a fine. It can be a combination of any of these, we fine, warning, and classes whatever the panel deems to be appropriate for the situation. Um, there's also probation that can be imposed, but um, please keep in mind that probation is not a form of discipline. Um, <coughs> the times that we, um, our panels have found it appropriate to impose um, probation is in really when it comes to those who they would typically maybe want to consider suspension of their membership. So the way probation works is discipline is rec the discipline recommended by the hearing panel is held in abeyance, meaning that it's held back. We're not gonna require that you do this yet unless you are found in violation, again, within the probationary period, which is which is one year. Is that, okay, so it's all showing up again. So what, would typ what typically happens, and what has happened in the past with some decisions that we've had is that the actions were particularly egregious, which is why the hearing panel even considered suspension, um, they also obviously maybe wanted a fine and some classes and that letter of reprimand placed in the file. And they said, you know what? You still have to pay the fine and you still have to take the class. Um, we're still going to put this letter in your, um, folder, in your folder, your realtor folder with us. But, you know, we actually, we do probably want to keep you as a member. We want to make sure maybe we can keep our eye on you, nothing else happens. And like I said, realtor membership, we understand and recognize as a really important property right of, of a person. So we, but we're, so instead of suspending your membership with us for 30 days to a year, we're gonna hold that in advance and put you on probation. And if at the end of the probation period, which is one year, there is no other violations, then your suspension has been, will go kind of go away. That suspension will not be imposed. If you are found in violation, 
not only are going, are you going to have to comply with the discipline imposed and that new decision that found you in violation, we're also going to tack on and impose that suspension that we were holding in advance. Um, Who is notified of that? Everybody. Would the agents of the broker be notified of being? Of the if it's the broker, not the, the agents are not notified. So if it's the agent, the broker is notified, but not the other way around. So we agents of an unscrupulous broker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the question was, um, you know, who was notified about you know, these particular discipline? So decisions, remember guys, decisions are confidential. You know, they're not, they're not, you know, obviously if you're an agent, your broker is going to be looped in because we expect your broker to make sure that you comply with the discipline. We expect your broker to also make sure, you know what, maybe I need to stay on top of this agent. Um, however, if it's the broker that's the one that's got a violation, we're not then sending that decision to all of his or her agents. So, I mean, it's important for agents to know not to work for an unscrupulous broker, I suppose. <laughs> um, and as I was saying earlier, if discipline is multi-part, the hearing panel can choose to require the member to complete one while holding the other in advance slash information period, not longer than a year. Um, and whenever I have a hearing, I always include that, I always try to encourage them to include um, a statement for when um, non-compliance of discipline occurs. Mm -hmm. Meaning if I you know, say, you know what, I came, you found me a violation, but I'm not paying this $250 fine, nor am I gonna take this contracts class. I always encourage panels to put in there, failure to complete the required discipline results in this punishment. Now it may be an increased fine, an increased um, number of courses that you have to take. Um, we'll put that in there. What I do tell panels though is that that probably shouldn't be the last step because if they've laughed in your face the first time, they're going to do it the second time. So the last step should be failure to, com to comply with discipline of the above results in suspension of membership until you have complied. So at that point, we've given them the opportunity to, to comply with the decision. We've given them the opportunity to, to comply again. Maybe, maybe something got away from them. Maybe they didn't think we were going to be serious about it, but we've given them a second opportunity. And at this point, the decision will say, if you don't, if you're going to continue to not comply, we're going to suspend your membership. Um, that's encouraged to be put in decisions because if, uh, if it's not in the decision and the respondent realtor doesn't comply, we've got to come back in front of a panel and say, why didn't you comply? It, it, and then that panel then will say, you have to comply, maybe you have to comply with more discipline. And so it just takes to prevent that extra step. It already puts into place. And it's been approved by the um, executive committee, what happens for non-compliance. So that should go in just about every ethics decision. Um, appealing decisions. So arbitrations cannot be appealed because a party disagrees with an outcome. Invariably, one party's gonna disagree when you have an arbitration. Someone's gonna be unhappy with me, clash the panel. I will say, just for all you guys to know, that I constantly put the blame on you all when I get the <laughs> That is, yeah, I constantly do that. Oh, well, I don't understand. Well, that was the panel's decision. Got it. I'm sorry. You gotta communicate with me, but like, I'm constantly throwing you guys under the bus. <laughs> they, that's what they decided. This is their process. <laughs> so, um, so in arbitration, the parties um, are not cannot appeal based on their unhappiness with the way the outcome. Um, their only basis for appeal are procedural deficiencies with the hearing on the lack of due process that goes to the panel wasn't paying attention. I was told before I got here that uh, Christy was on the panel where a panelist fell asleep one time. That is a basis for, uh, if you're sleeping through a hearing, you're probably not giving them a fair hearing. <laughs> Chances are. So, um, but these, the, those procedural things, that's the only basis. Someone had an unfair hearing. Um, I got there. I was made from the panel lip. <laughs> wow. Um, ethics. Um, the complainant can only appeal on um, the those same things: procedural deficiencies, lack of due process. The complainant can't appeal because the panel they don't like the fact that the panel didn't discipline them enough, didn't find them in violation. Only procedural issues. So for the respondent. Oh. So I know. 
So the respondent has three bases of appeal, one of them also being the, um, why is this not? Okay, it is. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry guys. Um, so one of them is also procedural deficiency. So any party in any hearing is always gonna have the right to say, I didn't have a fair hearing, procedural deficiencies. The respondent also has the right to appeal on misapplication of the facts to the articles of the code. So this is not intended to be a rehearing of the case. This is intended to be, well, you said, you said something that was a violation, but this article doesn't even cover that action, a misapplication of the code. And if the panel says, the appeal panel says, you know what, that is a misapplication, it goes back, it can either go back to the hearing panel to rehear it, or they can say there is no violation. Um, and then the last one is gonna be the discipline and codes recommended by the hearing panel. So that is gonna be when I fail to send that buyer brokerage agreement, but you fined me $15,000 and you suspended my membership because I accidentally forgot to share it in that week with you. Yeah, they're probably gonna to wanna to appeal that and they're probably gonna win that. Um, so the ethics hearing panel can, uh, appeal panel um, for that can recommend lower discipline, but they cannot increase the discipline. So if someone feels that the $500 fine for failing to send a brokerage agreement is too high. That come, the, the appeal panel can look at that and say, actually, I think it should have been a thousand and up it. So they can look at it, they can, they can disagree, they can deny the appeal, or they can agree with the appeal and they can say, I don't know what's happening with that. Um, and they can say, We're gonna, we can lower it. Um, like I said earlier, any of these um, hearings are not about rehearing the case on the merits. The case only gets heard on the merits if it's remanded for a new case, particularly when there has been a procedural flaw. Um, so, I, Christina, yes. So somebody files an appeal because they felt they didn't have a fair hearing, but on tape they did say that they felt it was a fair hearing. So the question, <coughs> Yes, so the question was, you know, on the, t so for those of you guys who have not sat on a hearing yet with me, um, at the end of every hearing, the chairperson, once the testimony concludes, the chairperson says, do the parties feel like you have had a fair, a fair hearing? Yes or no? Parties, most of the time it is a fair hearing and the parties will say yes. Um, sometimes they'll say, if they say, if they ever say no, which I always try to encourage if they feel something, was unfair to say it so they can put it on the record. <coughs> just because a party, however, just because a party says, yes, I felt like I had a fair hearing, I felt like I was able to present witnesses, doesn't, make, doesn't prevent them from being able to file an appeal. Now, during the appeal hearing, they may say, the appeal panel may ask, well, did you dispute it that you had a fair hearing? You know, well, why did, you know, did you, what made you say yes? And you know, the answer is typically, well, I felt like I had to, and sometimes, you know, the fact that they say yes doesn't mean they're going to lose their appeal. I mean, if they, can, if they say yes, I thought I had a fair hearing, but they already felt what they perceived to be the bias against them, of course, they're going to say yes, and then they may be able to show that. And so they're not going to lose their appeal merely by saying, yes, I thought I had a fair hearing. But it, it, will be, it is something that is asked and pointed out. About. And we do, I do try to let the, pin, um, the parties know that if they feel like something went wrong, they should say it. And if... I, a lot of times the, the question will get asked and I'll see the person like sigh and be like, I guess, sure. And I'll, but I'll step in and I will say, you know, it seems like you are, you know, that you don't really need that. Is there something you would like to kind of expound on? Because we want everything we can on record. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if they say no, I felt, you know, for, it might even just be that they, if they say no, I feel like they just were unfair to me. I don't, there's, I don't know what I can do to address that. If they say no, there's a question I really wanted to ask, but, you know, the chairperson was telling me that I kept repeating myself too many times. I may say, well, what was that question? And it's, if it's a question they asked too many times, I'm not sure what else we can do about it. But if it is something that can be addressed at that point, we want to go ahead and try to do that. So. So even if, it's, yeah. if 
they say no, is it okay to say, you know, I'm sorry to hear that and move on? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, have a good day. Yeah, I, mean, I, I will say that sometimes that's what, you know, we have to do because I think that some parties are just going to, they're just going to say no and they're going to be, you know, they're going to say, well, I, you just keep cutting me off. You wouldn't let me keep talking and talking when it, in fact, already said it. And so sometimes, it, sometimes the response either by myself or the chairperson has to be, that is noted for the record. So, all right, so we're just gonna, it looks like we're wrapping up a few, um, do you guys have any other questions before we kind of go into these kind of last few wrap up, poll questions, stuff, stuff? Any other questions about this process, start to finish? I hope that you guys all have um, a good understanding. I know for some of you guys are serve on both grievance and professional standards, some just serve on one or the other. So I hope that for those who just serve on one panel versus one on both, that you guys understand the difficult and important role that the other serves. So, all right, so we're gonna do just a few last questions. If I don't know this poll. Did we finish? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, my PowerPoint like background was a little bit different than yours. I had to redo a lot of things last night to kind of make sure that this window up in that corner doesn't block what you're seeing the words. So I probably left out a few slides, but let me think. Let me just make sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, so a lot of this stuff I think we also kind of addressed at um, what we were going over. So ethics hearings, the appeal hearing can affirm the decision, which is basically deny the appeal. So just like a grievance camp, a, group of, you know, a grievance that is by a disgruntled buyer that really has no basis that comes to me, it still goes to the grievance if it's been filed. Any appeal hearing still comes to me. If it's been filed appropriately within those time frames, they still get to an appeal panel. And the appeal panel either approves of their appeal and either sends it back or they can affirm the decision of the first hearing panel, which thereby denies the appeal that was filed. Um, they can modify the discipline, as I stated earlier, um, but it cannot exceed the discipline imposed. So you can lessen it. So if the respondent says, this $15,000 fine is absolutely incredulous, I've never been found in violation, I literally just forgot to send something over and you charge me 15 grand, the hearing panel or the appeal panel can um, lower that fine. They obviously cannot increase it though. If they want to increase it, they can recommend to the panel to review it. Um, but the respondent, if you're ever going to impose more onto a respondent, you have to give them the chance to then appeal that and address that. Um, they can dismiss the complaint if the facts don't support um, a potential violation of the code. So this is also, you know, like I said, arbitrations are great because there's no findings of fact, but um, ethics complaints, you know, we wanna make sure that the parties understand why there was or was not a finding of a violation. So. If the facts that are put into the decision don't allege a possible violation, that can still be, the complaint can still then be dismissed. And then, or you can refer the complaint for a new hearing if there was a procedural deficiency. So that's the importance of really like I said, making sure that you are able to have a fair hearing, hold, you know, ask not leading questions, not show bias. Um, if no appeal is filed, as I mentioned earlier, the decisions are all approved by the board of directors. Or, so I keep saying that because that's how we do it at NAR. So it's at the GAR level is approved by our executive committee or a, sub, a panel of our executive committee. We're definitely not putting this in front of the GAR board of directors. Um, so the executive committee has the ability to, and what they typically do is approve the decisions. Um, but they do have, if they notice in the decision that there seem to be some procedural deficiencies lacking, they have the ability to, at that point, remand it back to the hearing and say, we need a new one because there's something in this in this decision that makes it appear that there was a lack of due process. Excuse me. And if, even if I, as the um, respondent, didn't appeal my $15,000 fine for failing to submit something, the board of uh, the executive committee can say, that's a little bit severe for 
for this. Like, I don't think that this warrants our member being fined 15 grand because they forgot to send something over and they can then lessen the discipline as well. Um, if they think that a, a more severe discipline needs to be fine, uh, imposed, they can find, um, they can recommend that a higher discipline be imposed, but again, the respondent has to be given the opportunity to okay. appeal that. And then, um, oh yeah, and, if, and then for arbitration hearings, the decision is final after 20 days. There's, um, if there's no appeal, it doesn't go to the board of directors or the executive committee, it's final. Um, if the parties, um, if there's the non-prevailing party, um, did not pay or did not abide by the award, this is an enforceable uh, award in the court, so it can't be brought to us to enforce, but you can take that decision and have it enforced in either small claims court, I think it's 15,000 right now for in Georgia, or if it's more than 15,000, um, you can have that award enforced in state or superior court. So that is, um, sorry about that. Sorry on the first, on the first defense, can it be enforceable in the first defense arbitration? Yeah, because that, that is a, by virtue, so the question was, can this, can the award be enforceable on the first violation? And the answer is yes, because this is the decision that two brokers may agree to abide by, by virtue of their membership with us. And then they came to the hearing, and the, pan, the arbitration panel made the decision and signed it. And that is an award that, it doesn't matter if it's your first or 15th offense, or time to the panel, that can be um, um, enforced, sorry. Yeah. Has it, has, has it ever been considered? I, I like the idea of the previously that you said that if you don't do this, you're the in abeyance conversation, mm -hmm. that your license is suspended until you fulfill your obligation. Has it ever been considered? Your realtor membership. Uh, sorry. Uh, is, has it ever been considered that that kind of a, a and if you don't clause, be added to something like this? Because this is kind of a high, in my opinion, kind of a high cliff to go off if the respondent does not fulfill their obligation, their financial obligation, that your only option is to go to court. And there's no other consequence to the respondent unless the complaint is willing to go to court. So we at GAR cannot impose anything um, more than what NAR has prescribed to us. And NAR has said that you have come in front of us, we have made you, we have made our decision, and it is a binding decision, but however, if the party is not going to agree, this is a contractual decision, if someone's not going to agree, you can, you have to go to the courts to enforce it. GAR is not a court of law, we cannot enforce these sorts of decisions. Code of Ethics is a membership obligation, and they, and they come back in front of, it can't be brought to us to enforce. It may be, you may be able to bring a code of ethics violation down the road for something that was related to it, but they didn't abide by their, their obligation, their membership duty, their duty under the code of ethics. But as far as enforcement of it, we can't attach, we don't discipline for failure to pay. Failure to pay, they're going to be disciplined by having that enforced because we have rendered our decision. So NAR has not, I mean, if NAR put something in there, we would probably would look into whether or not it should be adopted into our policy, but for arbitrations, we cannot. But in that case, a local board could refuse to renew that person's membership. They could make a decision to refuse the person's membership, the person who is not refusing to pay the board. The local, so the, so the statement was that the local board could refuse to, to renew membership for? If the person who is, who, who is not paying the fine. Okay, I don't know if I really, I mean, I don't handle a lot of local board membership, so the state is that the local board may be able to refuse renewal of membership for failure to pay an arbitration award. I don't. I know they can do that if they fail to comply with an ethics decision. I don't know if that's necessarily the case for an arbit for failure to pay an arbitration award. Okay. Um, so I'm not. To be honest, I'm just not sure about that. So. Yes. Sir. Um, if in that question of do you think the hearing was fair, the respondent says no. I think. That Bert Harrington was biased and uh, predisposed. Can I can they then excuse that board member from the executive session and continue with the executive session without the person that they thought was biased? So the 
so the question is, if during the kind of closing statement, the one of the parties or responded to the complaint and says, no, this one panelist is clearly very biased against me, you know, this is, and then can that panelist be excused from executive session? I don't know that the party gets to make that decision. No. I would say, I would say probably not. Plus, you'd have the problem now. You got an even number of sitting on your panel. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you would. You pretend you do put yourself potentially in a two-two decision. I would say that the party, obviously, they're, they're, it's noted um, for on the record that they felt that Bert Harrington was biased against them. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, and they may want to put that in the based on the decision. But the decision is more than just one person, too. So you know. Maybe you are biased against them, but you, the panel can the other way, so there's no harm, no foul. But at the end of the day, there's a whole panel. It's not just you know one party. So I don't, I, I would think it would be inappropriate to, to, to um, excuse that one person. So are there any other questions? This was if we had time, but since we are, luckily I made it to my three-hour mark, which I was unsure of I was going to do. So. Um, so yeah, it was just a, if you wanted to talk come about your favorite kind of ethics article, but all of them, I mean, but all right, well, I think that, I mean, that's it. Don't forget to put out your evaluation, guys, and we really appreciate that. Um, Good job,